Klockan är nio. It is 9 a.m. and this uh, means that we will open uh, the, today's session. Party leaders debate. The prime minister and leader of the moderate party, the largest opposition party, are entitled to a speech of no more than seven minutes, and the other party leaders are entitled to a speech of no more than five minutes. The speeches are given in the order of relative size of the parties. There is no right of reply to the first speeches. This is followed by a second round, during which all the participants in the debate are entitled to no more than two minutes. There is a free right of reply to these speeches, and the rejoinders are taken in the order of relative size of the parties, with a dueling method, no more than one minute per speech. The speeches are made from the rostrum on the platform, and rejoinders are made from the rostrums in front of the platform. Prime Minister Stefan Löfven of the Social Democratic Party. First, you have the floor. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to start by quoting Wilhelm Mauve, the writer. Make the most of your life and don't waste your life because it's now this is your time on earth. And I think it's our responsibility to really make the most of our short time on this in this world, to look after the environment, the world around us and the people around us. However, our time on Earth is changing, is about to change radically, because the climate crisis that we're in the middle of is an emergency, and we're going to need more global cooperation, green uh, investments here. We need to create a better society than the one that we once inherited. Together, we need to spend our time on this Earth to save the most important thing that we have, and that is the planet. Now. A hundred years ago, we became a democracy in Sweden, thanks to the Liberals and the Social uh, Social Democrats in this chamber. And despite the fact that earlier it was difficult to cooperate, and despite the opposition, strong opposition from the Conservatives, we were able to introduce democracy in Sweden. It's through political coalitions through, between democratic parties that we can move ahead. That is how Swedish democracy is constructed, and that still applies. And cooperation and compromise, as some say, uh, is playing with democracy or ignoring the will of the people. I've heard many people say these things from the right, right round about the world, trying to create a people a suspicion and um, of election results, and also with regard to our authorities and institutions. We see this happening in many countries, and we also see this starting to happen here. Mr. Speaker, the same companies would also like to change focus, shift focus from having opened the door to a party that wants to destroy, which is make what, what destroy what makes Sweden strong: equality, freedom, democracy. A party, party that is inspired by countries like Poland and Hungary, and the developments that we see there, where democracy is being undermined step by step and destroyed, where free media and uh, the world of academia are being destroyed, and the conspiracy theories are, sp are spread. And and where the rights of women uh, and um, LGBT rights are being under threat as well. And I understand that, that you want to shift focus, but the electorate has the right to know the risks these parties are prepared to take when it comes to giving decisive power to a party that wants to destroy what so many people love about our country. Mr. Speaker, the government had the great honour of welcoming Germ German uh, von Frau Steinmeier, the president of Germany, last week. And he said, let me quote, freedom and the rule of law is something that needs to be, con uh, never be can never be conquered, should never be taken for granted, neither in Berlin or in Stockholm. That's the end of the quote. Now, Germany, they know how vulnerable a democracy is. And there, the right have closed the door to right-wing extremism. And that's the path the Swedish right could have chosen as well. Sweden is not vaccinated against this type of anti-democratic, authoritarian waves that we see in the world around us. Democracy cannot be taken for granted. Democracy begins and starts with us as citizens. Mr. Speaker, I'm a social democrat because I believe that together we can create a much better world than we've seen up until now. And I know that building a society is something that never ends. We always need to move ahead and make progress. We have huge challenges that we face in our society. There are 
problems with our, uh, our common welfare system, too many people who are unemployed. We have horrible gang crime killing people. Not least, we have uh, this urgent climate crisis on our hands as well. But none of these challenges is too great for us to be able to handle them. Society is really something constructed by people. We together can create it. We together can change it. Mr. Speaker, I'm also a Social Democrat because I want to build a society which is so strong that people don't have to be weak. That's why in 2014 we changed poli the political path to try to make a more equal, sustainable Sweden, which is why we've made historic investments in the welfare system, and that is why we're also trying to deal with the market experiments of the right which have damaged our welfare society, because we're all dependent on a strong welfare system which is there for all of us from cradle to grave, which is why we need to ensure that anybody who becomes ill or unemployed should receive the best support and clear requirements, but not poverty. Because we know that the employers, they will not hire people because they've become poor, but because they have the training, the, the qualifications that, that the job requires, which is why Sweden needs to take on the lead when it comes to the green transition, everything th that the whole world needs to do, because these investments in Sweden, we see in Sweden now, see that we can, in fact, reduce emissions and create new job opportunities, which is why we also are investing in more police and, uh, and raising sentences at the same time of trying to prevent uh, crime, because we listen to the police. We understand that we need to reinforce or we need investments in schools, for example, so that we can break the dominance of the gangs. And the choice in a year's time will stand between increased cohesion, the sense of community and society, or an open door to forces that threaten what we love most about Sweden, the welfare system, the sense of togetherness, the sense of belonging and trust. And that is the choice that we have to make, this type of Sweden that we want. Mr. Speaker, I'm a social democrat because I know that we people, we have so much more in common than what differs between us. I'm a social democrat because I believe that everybody has a right to a sense of security, sense of belonging. We can choose how we wish to spend our time on this earth and we should if we want to spend our time e increasing mistrust or if we want to instead build a stronger society a more sustainable world and a stronger sense of togetherness i know what i choose what i choose to spend my time how i choose to spend my time on this earth thank you Thank you. Next, Ulf Kristersson from the Moderate Party, please. The floor is yours. Herr Talman. Mr. Speaker, after many years of working within the scope of Swedish politics, this is the final debate for Stefan Löfven. In Sweden, we have a tradition I very much like, distinguishing between persons and issues. You can dislike somebody's opinion, but you can respect the individual who puts forward this opinion. It's very close to the classical ideals of the freedom of speech. I disagree with what you're saying, but I'm prepared to die to defend your right to say what you're saying. But let me get back to Stefan Löfven a little bit later in today's debate, because today it is time to evaluate the results of the government's policies. It's time to review and close the books after their seven years in power. Nothing has impacted Sweden quite as much over the past few years as serious criminality. Since government, the government uh, came into power in 2014, gang crime has literally and metaphorically exploded. Sweden has more lethal shootings than any other comparable, uh, comparable country, and this summer has been the bloodiest in modern Swedish history, spreading fear in housing areas and suburbs. 
explosions and shootings are the most extreme expressions, but we see it in several areas in the past seven years. Sexual offences have increased, muggings of children more than doubled in numbers, and there are uh, an increasing number of parents who will not allow their children to go home unaccompanied. No one in here would like this to be the case, obviously not. However, this government has failed to prioritize the truly important issue for this country. Didn't have quite the what it took to make the necessary decision. This is very provoking to me. Investing billions in a so-called family week when the problem is in fact the fact that one person is shot to death every week. Long-term unemployment is coming close to 200,000. It's the highest number in Swedish history. We have the fourth highest unemployment in the EU after Greece, Italy and Spain. That's quite a bit from the best numbers in the EU. Child poverty and cramped living conditions are spreading in Swedish more, most exposed suburbs and problems that Sweden had resolved are coming back. Year after year, the government fails to meet the Swedish climate targets. According to the Council on Climate Policy, there's a debt of emissions built up. Fossil-free nuclear is being dismantled, leading to an increase in emissions. And over and over again, we suffer from a shortage of electricity in Sweden. This is a poor closing of the books. There are some highlights. Swedish public finances are strong in a European context. And there's a broad uh, agreement on the need to strengthen our defense and armed forces. This is good. But otherwise, problems are extensive. And they've, uh, the situation has deteriorated. This is not just the opinion of myself and the moderate party. One survey after another confirms that a majority of the Swedish people feel that Sweden is headed, headed in the wrong direction. But do not despair, because closing the books opens up for a new start. And the moderate party is ready to gather people around the task of bringing order to Sweden. It doesn't require any miracles, but it does require a government who can understand the problems and can get to grips with them, who will tell things as they are, who can focus on the substantive matters, the topical issues, and who can speak to everyone to get something done. Polarization, divisions and political games. If such features could have resolved problems, Sweden wouldn't, Sweden would have had any problems at all today. Working to get Sweden in good order has to begin immediately after the election. And three issues are more important than anyone else. First of all, criminality. We have more severe, serious crime in Sweden than other countries, but we also have weaker legislation. It's not enough to just make adjustments on the margin. The moderate party would like to use Sweden's own terror legislation against the gangs. Th there's legislation already existing uh, Along the same lines in, in Denmark and Finland, we will man-mark the members of gangs. We will come to their homes. We, anyone who's a member uh, and who's not a Swedish citizen will be expelled. We will have visitation uh, zones. We will have double sentencing for those who are involved in gang criminality and many more police officers who will be fully supported in their difficult task. The second major issue is long-term unemployment. We need a, a financial policy uh, and financial politics in Sweden to favor jobs and entrepreneurship and to uh, combat exclusion and living on welfare. So we need a ceiling, a cap on welfare and lower taxes on lower income so that it, you can always make more money from working than being on welfare. Everyone in Sweden who's new in this country should learn the Swedish language to be employable, understand their rights and obligations, and we will introduce linguistic requirements and that one step at a time you get to work your way into the welfare state. A new government will reduce immigration, otherwise we will never manage integration. And the third issue is uh, the matter of how Sweden will be a world class, lead, world class leader on green transition and green growth. Climate change is a threat to humanity and the most recent UN report confirms the previous ones. At the same time, we also know more now about the solutions and the commitment has never been as great as it is now. Everyone wants to contribute to this transition. Citizens and employees, consumers and suppliers, businesses and shareholders. Swedish companies invest billions in sustainability. Now, the world of politics needs to needs to team up with the business community. A new government will guarantee clean, stable electricity uh, 
provision and defend all fossil free electricity production hydropower wind power and nuclear power we will simplify uh, licensing processes removing red tape and we will stand up to swedish uh, to defend swedish forestry and individual ownership rights crime unemployment and the climate are the three issues where sweden needs to set a new cap and have a new start. It will take time, so we need to begin now. It's going to be difficult, but it's not impossible. We're going to be working day and night to turn the tide and bring order to Sweden. Thank you. Thank you. Jimmy Åkesson of the Sweden Democrats is our next speaker for his first address. You have the floor. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker. Seven years, seven years with the beautiful words, promises, promises that were never carried out. And now we see the end result. We see insecurity spreading throughout the country, places where we grew up, where we used to feel safe and secure today in many places across the country, they have been totally destroyed. We have seen lethal shootings and other serious violent crime across the country. Ten lethal shootings just in August, the highest number ever since we started to look at that statistics. Many open uh, investigations into homicides, some 250 just in Stockholm, and we see violent crime all the time. And we have, uh, on top of that, minor crime that is happening every day. Bicycles being stolen, burglaries, uh, threats, uh, and so-called youth gangs acting as hooligans, uh, and the children being robbed, uh, clothes and phones taken away from them, sexual abuse, criminal gangs. Uh, are taking over streets, parts of towns. Two clans crashed uh, in the town of Lund only a couple of weeks ago outside the emergency ward at the hospital. I can hardly believe it's true. And we see that terror is winning. And of course, this leads to even more insecurity. Normal people today have to adapt their lives and they cannot live the way they want to live their lives, but have to adapt to what criminals decide that they should be able to do. But we can not just give up. We cannot just surrender to these individuals that should be imprisoned. And we have to look at reality the way it actually is. We just got a report on the background of criminals, and that is good reading. A majority of uh, these individuals who are suspects of crime, the majority have a foreign background. The majority of those who are suspects of uh, crimes against women, rape, they have a foreign background. Looking at men who are second generation immigrants with a background in Africa, Almost one third of those individuals have been a suspect of a crime between 2015 and 2018, that period of four years that was looked at. And governments, governments today and those we've had before, they have closed their eyes to this fact. They have refused to investigate because Stefan Levin and the others, they simply do not want to know the trouble they've caused to Sweden and the Swedes. And it might be uncomfortable for other parties here in the Riksdag, but truth is, we were right, you were wrong. That is a simple fact. And when we are given the opportunity to govern Sweden, we will not just be right, we will also do right. Sweden 
has 300,000 pensioners living in poverty, most of them being women. A majority of uh, the Swedes feel concerned when it comes to the retirement age. And we have, uh, at the same time as we have so many pensioners living in poverty, we have the highest taxes or among the highest taxes in Europe. And I want to, Mr. Speaker, I want to give everyone in Sweden a promise, a promise to all who are retired, who will retire. Pensions will be a decisive issue for us in future collaborations. If you want to support from the Sweden Democrats, you have to, like us, prioritize pensioners and pensions. And here, Mr. Speaker, it's key, it's very, very important that we have more people employed. What was to be the lowest employment rate in Europe has become one of the highest. And we cannot close our eyes to this fact any longer. We have 700,000 immigrants in this country who cannot provide for themselves. And Mr. Speaker, it's obvious that that is creating a great imbalance in our welfare system. We need a new government. Thank you. Thank you. And the next address is uh, from Anja Löf, the Centre Party. <coughs> Mr. Speaker, finally. In my 10 years as party leader, I and other centre party members have often been alone in highlighting issues that are important to rural Sweden. But now, finally, we can glimpse a change. We see how more and more parties and politicians are lifting their eyes and seeing the whole country. And this is a welcome change, it's an important one, for it's about the living conditions for the millions of people who live outside our major cities. It's about the important parts of our country where our forests, iron ore, energy and food can be found. Our rural areas and countryside deserve a lot more attention from more people, not just through fine words and brief visits, but through constructive politics that makes a difference to people's everyday lives, that take our countryside, rural areas, homesteads, on a journey into the future. There's a great deal that is very important to ensure a stronger Sweden. Here we can find the entrepreneurial spirit, innovations, sustainable agriculture, farms and forests that give us renewable energy, that give us climate smart building materials. We need lower taxes, less red tape, smart solutions, green investments for everyone who lives in and from our countryside. It's highly important both for the freedom and success of individuals, but also for the success of the whole of the country. This is why the Centre Party is so clear with the fact that we wish to ensure that the protection of our shores is fairer, because it empowers more and makes it possible for more people to live, build and develop their lives around the country, take away crazy rules that have a general negative impact and most severely affect the inland areas of Norland, and we need to give more of hope for the future and greater freedom. It's also the reason why we are continuing to fight for stronger ownership rights for Sweden's forestry owners, for people who have maintained and worked their forests in a sustainable way for generations, who have for a long time now and still uh, do guarantee that there are jobs and that we have biological diversity and also at the same time provide us with the forest renewable resources. We must safeguard the strength of every single human being, regardless of where in the country they choose to live. We also need to ensure that we are better at gathering forces of the whole country and using our strengths in the best possible way. We need to continue to invest in roads, railways, fibre. We need to continue investing in a functioning education system, accessible care throughout the country, ensure that everyone feels safe and secure in the countryside, in our marginalised and deprived areas, in suburbs. We really need to expand our Swedish electricity grid to increase our production of electricity and ensure that clean, renewable electricity is available in the whole of the country, from the north to the south, for heavy industry to innovative green startups. Uh, startups. For example, 
that it is available at the hangar at Serva Airport outside Gothenburg, where they are in the process of creating our green future on the premises of a company called Hart Aerospace, and the airplane running entirely on electricity is being built. It will be able to fly 400 kilometers on one charge, totally free of carbon dioxide emissions. Already the world's third largest aviation company, United Airlines, has already signed up for 100 planes. Green climate smart aviation is about to become a reality. And a Swedish company is leading the way. That is what the result of tough, long-term climate goals and a growth-oriented, ambitious corporate policy can look like. That is how innovation, technology, and also the, the strength of individuals can make a difference. Lead Sweden and the world and make us greener, make us smarter and more flexible. And if we're going to succeed and solve the climate crisis that has We've given, we've been given painful lessons of this this summer, then there is no other road ahead. We, the political sphere, must point out a clear direction with ambitious climate goals for reduced emissions. We need to continue to invest in new technology, like, for example, hydrogen and negative emissions. We need to continue forging ever stronger cooperation with the EU so that, we can, that the EU can press ahead and also put pressure on high emissions countries like China so that, really, so that they really can change. And we also must also ensure that we are able to give freedoms to those who are going to lead the technological uh, path the way. And so we're going to continue being the, uh, to be a green, liberal and independent force for all, for a Sweden that moves ahead for the climate, for a sense of security and for, the, uh, for us all and for the countryside. For a Sweden that sticks together, where we develop together, we need to continue to be a constructive force for more open and honest forms of cooperation at the centre of Swedish politics, because we know that that is where our strengths and ideas lie, to ensure that Sweden can issue, continues to be a green role model. Uh, we need to give people a path out from insecurities and despondency to make use of all the strength and power we see in people across the country, in our cities as well as in the countryside and in the rural areas. And then, I mean, we, we need to be ensure that we are forced to reckon with in the Sweden of tomorrow, and I mean, of course, the whole of Sweden. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, Nushi Dadgoska from the Left Party, please. Herr Talman. Mr. Speaker, one year left to the regular elections. If there will be any additional elections before that is something I will leave unsaid. We have a historically weak government who has chosen not to uh, benefit from the support of a majority in Riksdag and in our parliament. They will leave behind them mass unemployment, a wild west situation in the Swedish school system, and an undermining in the care sector, which is very tough on both those in care and those working there. The income pension supplement is introduced um, any day now. It's an additional supplement amounting to 600 kroner, according to the government, but only about half of those in retirement are concerned. Those with the lowest income receive nothing, and most, a very extensive majority, will receive a lot less than the 600 kroner. But we know what uh, life looks like, everyday life, for many of our retirees. Express, a newspaper wrote about it about a month ago. Maria, who is severely ill, who worked in schools and is using savings to afford food. Auxiliary nurse Irma, who's still working on an hourly basis and uh, doesn't have a home. Bus driver Lars, who's 69 years old, has an aching body, but is forced to continue to work to make ends meet. Retirees living in camper vans because they can't afford other housing. How can the Social Democrats call this minor supplement a real investment in the uh, retirees of Sweden. To get an additional 50 kroner could not be the make or break for Lars. We are the, w the country in EU where people work the longest and still we're at the very bottom of the list in relation to our pensions. Why do so many parties in the Riksdag from left to right stick to this dysfunctional pension system? Rather, Social Democrats and the moderates uh, party members have joined hands during this term of office to increase and raise the retirement age. That was a major mistake, if you ask me. In terms of the budget uh, bill for this autumn, my party has been very clear on the need to raise 
uh, the lowest pensions, because we need to do this one step at a time. The seniors of Sweden deserve better than what uh, the situation is right, like right now. Mr. Speaker, over the past 15 years, it hasn't in fact mattered whether we've had a moderate, the moderate party or social democrats in government, because they've both implemented very significant deteriorations and cutbacks in sickness insurance and sick pay, especially for those who are severely ill. Employees and businesses pay themselves their contributions to sickness insurance. It belongs to them and they should be able to avail of it when needed. Last year, in the midst of a health crisis and a pandemic, new records were set by the social insurance offices in Sweden in terms of rejecting applications for sick play. The social insurance ministers have been called Ulf Kristersson and Annika Strandhäll and they have both badly failed people in a very difficult situation in need of health care and rehabilitation. I know personally two of them who have been diagnosed with cancer, require extensive treatment. They've both had to use all their available time and effort to fight to get the money they are entitled to. Uh, they do not get approval of certificates. They do not accept anything but work on full time. They are not permitted to work part time and make the most of the working ability. You have the very strict rules have become a nightmare. We need an immediate redesign of the sickness insurance in the public uh, bill proposed by the government. We're taking important steps in the right direction complying with our wishes in several uh, elements when it comes to the sickness insurance, but it's important to be able to trust this insurance. In addition, it goes without saying that the employment benefit scheme we have currently needs to be made more permanent in a modern economy, which is constantly developing. Jobs can come and go, not least now when the business community will uh, go through a green transition. And we need a reliable unemployment benefit scheme for this. I assume that the government will give information to confirm that the current situation will be made permanent, not just using it as part of their election campaign. The wage earners of Sweden need to know today that they are protected and that they're not just part of an election strategy play, played out by the Social Democrats. Pensions, sickness insurance and unemployment benefit entitlements need to be redesigned and revamped to restore the Swedish model. We need to build Sweden strong again. Thank you. Ordet framförande går till Ebba Bush. Thank you. Ebba Bush of the Christian Democrats is our next speaker for her first address. You have the floor. Mr. Speaker, in 361 days, the Swedish citizens will vote. It will be a day when we will celebrate democracy. We can finally vote. The Swedish people will have its say about this government and the red-green rule we have had for close to eight years. And the question that each voter has to ask him herself is, has Sweden become a better or worse country? Is welfare better? The government, the rule of the country, is it better? Are the investments made that are necessary to secure jobs in the future? Are we safer? Each and every one will have to evaluate this current government it is part of our task as citizens, and I encourage everyone to look at reality because you recognize the tree when looking at the fruit. And I know, I know that there are some individuals who do no longer believe in politics because they see deteriorations in welfare, safety, security, but they want to believe that it is possible to turn things around. They have been discouraged, but they're looking for a courageous alternative. They feel in their hearts that politics has to take its responsibility, dare do more, and they want 
to see this alternative with a heart. But who to believe? I will never promise the moon, because if you promise perfection, you promise more than you can actually keep. But I will tell you about four principles, four principles that will guide us. One being that Christian democracy is about others. We are not, we've never been a party organized around class or self-interest. We want to make life better for others. We want to build a society for all. And that is why we always highlight the importance of family, health care that works, safety, security for those who are most vulnerable. The second of our principles is that we're prepared to talk to everyone. We're prepared to collaborate with all political parties here in the Riksdag if that is what is necessary, if that is what is best for Sweden. Politics is not about nice ideals. Um, politics is about making a difference. And thirdly, we are prepared to, to leave the same conversations, the same collaborations. We're prepared to leave the room if there are requirements posed on us that we are to abandon our basic values. And the deals, they do not have a value in themselves. They have to lead Sweden forwards. Fourthly, if there is a possibility, if there is such an opportunity, you can trust us, the Christian Democrats, so we will take that chance to change Sweden for the better. And you have to have that courage to look at alternatives and you have to be courageous to lead. We are not going to shy away from acute problems things that have crippled the current red-green government. We are going to shorten waiting times for health care. We are going to look at the legal system. We're going to have climate smart nuclear, and we're going to look at migration policy long term. We do not promise everyone everything, but we will keep what we promise. Two, that will believe in change, that haven't given up hope, are Stefan Danielsson, who used to be in the Riksdag as a member and who is also a member of the board of the Swedish um, Agricultural Association, and Mikael Beckström from the builders' brands of that association. They have joined the center party, and this is not a full scale medieval peasants' revolt, but uh, the word is being spread, and we are welcoming everyone. So join the Christian Democrats, because we want Sweden as a whole to work. In 361 days, we will vote. And do we want things to change? Do we want to end shootings? Do we want to shorten waiting times for health care? Do we want the entire country to function? Well, if we want to change, then you have to change how you vote. If you want change, you have to vote for change. We haven't given up hope. We know that we can turn things around and together we can create a Sweden that we can trust where the entire country works. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Thank you. We continue with Johan Persson from the Liberal Party. How do we on this? Mr. Speaker, in two weeks' time, Sweden will open up again to a more sort of updated, normal situation, at least for everybody who has been able to and also been very responsible and got their jams. So hopefully, very hopefully, we're going to leave a very difficult time period behind us, this pandemic, which has led to suffering amongst many people and difficult situations for people in their healthcare system, in schools. And we know that sports associations and others have had really real problems. And social care has also been under huge pressure. So there's a lot for us here to do to try to restore care for the elderly, for example. Now, we are facing problems in society 
that uh, we see in Sweden are really um, destroying people's lives. We have to, in the school education, for example, we need to restore order in the classroom, in the schoolyards as well, playgrounds. We need to also ensure that we do away with chaos, or violence, what we saw in Eslöv, in Malmö, for example, Neche, Halsby, and the Liberal Party. We have presented an order and social security uh, campaign for schools, so to enhance teaching in the classroom. So this is for teachers and pupils to feel safe. And the situation of teachers and the well-being of our pupils means that our teachers need support, not just for their, their teaching skills, but for other things as well. They need further training, further education. Let the state immediately take over the responsibility for the 28 schools which were included in the school inspectorate's report. These are the schools which are not able to deliver uh, and we sh but we should never, ever reduce our requirements with regard to qualifications and grades, etc. And tens of thousands of children, they don't receive the knowledge that they deserve is a decisive problem. Almost 15% f uh, receive a fail grade uh, in the compulsory, at the compulsory level and leave school is, means that we really need to reinforce teaching at that level. And after all the immigration uh, policy that we've had, we've, has led to mass unemployment and parallel societies in Sweden. It's these social figures or these social factor, this is where the g criminal gangs are able to gain ground. We see that many people are easy take pickings for criminals and leads to a deathly spiral on our streets. It's in these environments that those who are good and try to d d live a decent life, they are most vulnerable to the, sh the shootings, gang shootings. And the Liberal Party, we have submitted a, 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 a scheme to help these deprived areas for education, to help them get out of their sort of benefit rut and to earn a living, and to ensure also that there are job opportunities that we put them in focus. That's how we can manage to integrate our society better. And I think they're more than I, than I who just held my breath the other day. Well, last week, I think it was in the middle of the day in the city of Lund, we could see what seemed to be physical uh, men, me or men, healthy men. They were fighting each other. And then, one, of course, one wonders, and what on earth is happening? And the question was, why were these people not at work on an ordinary Monday. What on earth were they doing there? Mr. Speaker, we need uh, minerals and cement companies in Sweden to cr to uh, for production of batteries, for example. And we need to replace our fossil, the fossil fuels uh, with renewables. And we can see that Electricity is required throughout the country every day of the year, but the government hasn't got a map to show us how we're going to deal with this. And we can see that our electricity grid is weakened south of the Dalap River. Um, and luckily, though, because of imports, we uh, aren't, don't run out of electricity, but of course then it becomes extremely expensive on those particular dates. Now, what Sweden needs now, next year, we need a new non-socialist liberal government, which is decisive, really uh, deals with the problems that are basically making Sweden a poorer country. We need to guarantee welfare and well-being in the future so the people can survive. And Mr. Speaker, the liberals, the liberals, Shasha Elvis, 100 years ago, she stood here in this chamber and she would not have been Im impressed, I would say, how we deal with the problems in society that we face in society today, which is why we need a new government. Thank you. Thank you. Next, Marta Stenevi from the Green Party, please. Mr. Speaker, the summer of in the summer of 2018, it is estimated that approximately 700 Swedes died as a result of the 
extreme heat wave. And since then, extreme weather has occurred over and over again. We see many dramatic examples across the globe of forest fires, floodings and drought, with a great deal of human suffering as a result. The climate crisis is happening right now. This is why the climate policies of every party has to be measured against the benchmark of whether or not Sweden is complying with the Paris Agreement um, obligations. No, or not. We can invest in train and public transport across the country or uh, using wind power offshore, building wood, uh, uh, using wood for houses. We can put a stop to fossil fuels. We can choose to sharpen and s tighten our climate aims to get to zero emissions on, in 14 years. Or you can maintain diesel support, reduce the petrol tax, etc. And the, uh, it's a little bit uh, entertaining to see that we now have a green right, a little bit uh, as entertaining as when the Popular Party changed its name to the Liberals. No, the blue parties clearly are still waiting for someone else to take action somewhere else and some other time. And that my friends, is not climate policies. Because climate change is not something we have ahead of us, Mr. Speaker. It's happening here and now. This is why we're stepping up the support to, from uh, 25 to 500 million in support to municipalities in the climate transition. It's a lot of money, but it's absolutely a pittance compared to what we're going to have to pay in the future if we fail to achieve the Paris Agreement objectives. Mr. Speaker, during the summer, 17 people were shot to death. Organised crime is keeping entire housing estates and suburbs in a state of terror. Over 50 offences will receive higher penalties in a plan presented by the government. There's more in the pipeline. And I'm prepared to consider any sharpening of sanctions if it can stop, put a stop to gangs shooting people in the streets. They need to be behind bars. But when I listen to the blue and brown parties today, I can't help but ask myself how many young men will be killed in the summer of 2036 unless we invest in preventive measures now. Because right now, this year, there are boys born in exclusion and marginalized areas who will be in ninth grade. They will turn 15 in 2036 and they deserve to have their whole lives in front of them. Police, civil services, etc., have been issuing warnings, sounding the alarm for years about the situation for children in these suburbs. If we don't take the responsibility for a belief in the future and safety for all these people, they will grow up in child poverty, go to schools that don't have enough resources. We add 2.5 billion to the uh, legal elements in society. We need more tools. We need to make it. Uh, more feasible for uh, our prosecutors, etc., because that cost is nothing compared to if we lose an entire generation to the gangs. Mr. Speaker, every three weeks a woman is killed by a man she is involved with or has had uh, uh, been involved with. Almost one in six pupils stated recently in grade nine that they experience some type of honor related violence and oppression. This is just the tip of the iceberg of abuse, psychological terror, financial violence and oppression. An iceberg of sex buying documented brutal abuse of children sold and consumed hate and threats online to young children in the june the government presented an extensive package to combat men's violence against women and now finally we have permanent means allocated for systematic work to combat this violence for the first time efforts to be used to combat crime and to work with a preventive approach. It's a lot of money that's being allocated, but it is a pittance compared to the price paid by a child who's growing up with a violent parent. And it is nothing compared to the ultimate price paid by the women who are murdered by someone close to them. Mr. Speaker, now is when we decide how much the future is going to cost us in terms of money and lives. Now is when we can make a difference, when we deal with the most urgent needs here and now and keep our eyes to 
the horizon to keep track of the future. Thank you. Tack. Därmed var den första debatten. Thank you. That concludes the first round of uh, addresses. Prime Minister Stefan Löfven now has the floor for his second address. Tar man det svenska samhällsbygget är in. Mr. Speaker, the Swedish society we have built has not been inoculated against the political ideas where you want to grade people based on gender, the way they look, class. In one year we have elections and then voters are to decide on what kind of society we want to have. If we want to, to continue to support what many people love with the welfare, the trust, uh, or if we want a political development where we risk losing using a lot of those things that we love with our countries. We see extensive change in many other countries, and they did not arise overnight, but happened step by step. And the same thing could happen in Sweden. Mr. Speaker, it will be, well, it's almost two months until I will resign, but I want to take this opportunity to say thank you to everyone who has helped us dealing with the crisis, not least the terrible terror attack in Drottninggatan, but I'm also thinking about the pandemic that we have been managing together. To my party leader colleagues and to everyone, uh, to the Speaker's Bureau, I want to say thank you for the debates, uh, for everything you have done working for Swedish democracy, to everyone working in the Swedish Riksdag, the civil servants, the security staff, the cleaners, uh, chefs, uh, serving staff. I want to say thank Thank you to everyone. Thank you for everything you've done for the Swedish democracy. As I've said, uh, I'm not resigning quite yet. I'm looking forward to continued debates and uh, the session where we'll have questions and answers here next month. I know pretty much what will happen and what will be being said. But I want to say thank you anyway to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And the following have asked for rejoinders of Christosan, Jimmy Okesan, and Löv Nordsjö-Dagostar, Eva Bush, and Johan Persson, and Märta Strivni. And we begin with Ulf Christosan from the Moderate Party. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to say a few words to Stefan Löfven now on the occasion of his final debate as Prime Minister and Party Leader. Let me first just underline what everyone in here already knows. It is a remarkable career that you have made through Swedish uh, society, and everyone will uh, confirm that you have always done it through a sense of duty. You may disagree on the party political activist of Stefan Löfven. We are all used to being uh, receiving both praise and criticism. It's part of the job description. I'd like to say a few words about the Prime Minister when discussing with him uh, between four eyes in Rosenbad, government head offices or elsewhere. I very much appreciate that when I was recently elected, you invited me to discuss difficult issues, sometimes with an agenda, sometimes without an agenda. Sometimes we could quickly agree on other issues. We never agreed. And that is how politics has to work as well, without an audience to try and understand the convictions of the other party, even if you do not always share the final conclusions and sometimes oh, are, see the benefit of the arguments pre presented by your counterpart and the weakness of your own arguments. This didn't happen very often, let's be very clear on that, so you don't misunderstand uh, me, but enough times to give me an impression of the person, not just the role 
of the Prime Minister. I very much appreciated that, Stefan Levin, and I would like to thank you. And I can guarantee your, uh, the person who will be replacing you that I will be acting in the very same manner indeed. Politically, we mainly have uh, differences, but musically speaking, we have a lot in common. We had to guess each, guess each other's favorite music, and you knew everything about my uh, love of Kent, the group from Eskilstuna, and I realized that we both also very much appreciate Ulf Lundell. So now, when you will suddenly have eons of time available, I have some musical guidance for you and contributions. It's Swedish and international. It's historical and present day. And it unites generation after generation of Swedes. So when the rest of us travel to Almedalen in uh, July of next year, enjoying another hectic election campaign, you and Ulla will instead be afforded a trip to London to hear ABBA's new album, a new concert, ABBA The Voyage. Here are the tickets. I think you will both very much enjoy it. There you go. Thank you. Prime Minister, thank you, Mr. Speaker. That was uh, truly heartfelt, and I, I do think that Ulla is watching. So I believe that she is just as happy and thrilled as I am. We're truly looking forward to, to this. And um, I just want to say the same thing to you. I've really appreciated our talks, our discussions, your intellect, your cu curiosity, and... Uh, as you just said, sometimes we actually truly try to understand each other, understand the core of uh, what we want to accomplish, and not the least when discussing foreign politics and the Swedish security. That is important, that we disagree in many issues. Well, that's obvious, and I guess it has become clear throughout the years. But, um, well, that's nothing strange, but that you sometimes try to take a step back and look at that core in the arguments that you're presenting. I really appreciated that and also the debates where we have been tried each other's arguments and uh, I think you deserve all respect. I really appreciate you as a political opponent. We have had fierce, tough debates and we'll have a few more, I believe. And uh, I'm thinking about our October agenda. We will meet again. And I uh, truly, as I've said, appreciate what you've said and this very nice gift. Thank you. I take it that Ulf Kristersson has no additional rejoinder. Jimmy Åkesson of the Sweden Democrats is next for a rejoinder. Herr Talman. Mr. Speaker, Prime Minister. I had to do my math a little bit because the Social Democrats tend to uh, change their party leaders a little bit more or quite often. Stefan Levin is the fourth uh, counterparty for me during my years as party leader. So Social Democratic party leaders, they come and go, but some things remain permanent, at least for another while, I hope. Mr. Speaker. I'm sure we'll have ample opportunity to discuss the issues uh, uh, focused on by Stefan Löfven um, when he was up at the rostrum uh, in the next round of rejoinders. So I will drop that matter for now, and I'm going to an make an attempt to be nice. At the most recent election, Stefan Löfven uh, taught us that he enjoys a hot dog or sausages. There are not a lot of common uh, features uh, politically between myself and Stefan Levin, but we very much appreciate eating sausage and food. Food is something that brings people together, such as sausages. At least Jan Schermann agrees because he has written a book entitled The Swedish Sausage Journey. Here is a signed copy of that book. But and it, you mustn't just read 
about sausages, you should also enjoy one now and again. And with this book comes a particular type of sausage called Die Harder 6.0. It, it is not uh, to be perceived as a threat, covert or any other type of threat. It's uh, well wishing, it comes with good wishes for the future. It's just a culinary uh, unique product which uh, we would suggest that you try with your e evening coffee together with a lot but it it is very spicy however so a word of warning it's a little bit too spicy for my uh, preference but uh, considering all the spicy um, expressions used by Stefan Levin over the years I think he will be well able for this uh, type of sausage uh, than I am and I'd like to say thank you to Stefan Levin for all the debates and other things that we've shared over the years politically and all, to almost quote uh, Pippi Longstockings it was nice when you came but it was nicer when you left Thank you, Prime Minister Prime Minister Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, if this uh, sausage is too spicy for Jimmy Okasan, well, I will eat it, no doubt. And this is no secret that uh, Jimmy Okasan and I have very different views on people. Well, we're political opposites, quite simply. But I do think that it was one of my first debates in uh, the TV program Agenda, where, well, we uh, noticed for the first time how different we are in our political views, but I do respect you as a human being, an individual. I do. And I do think that when Jimmy Okison had a difficult time as a party leader, and it is difficult very often to be a party leader, uh, because, well, uh, you're being observed, viewed all the time, you want to come home, and uh, for a while you had to step back and say no, and you were open about the fact that you needed to, to take a break. And I appreciate that. A couple of weeks ago, I met a couple of young women, and they talked about their psychological ill health, and they said that it's so incredibly important that adults actually talk about this so that it's not... Uh, turned into a stigma that you can actually suffer from psychological ill health. And I think you did uh, a good service to society there, talking about uh, your difficulties, because it is important that we do that. And it's also important uh, to be able to distinguish uh, political views from the individual. And we have had uh, fierce debates, and we've also talked uh, um, outside of the public light and uh, that is important uh, to have that type of relationship as well and i appreciate that and i wish you all the best and i'm looking forward to trying this sausage thank you thank and thank you and we continue with the only love from the center party Mr. Speaker, Prime Minister, Stefan Löfven and I have disagreed in many issues over the years. We've tried to have an exchange of a, uh, on a certain energy policy report, for example. Stefan Löfven has uh, used uh, particular words to characterize our discussions indeed. But we've also managed to cooperate for Sweden and to keep powers of xenophobia Outside, Stefan Levin has been empowered for collaboration, a party leader colleague who has been true to his word. What has been agreed upon between four eyes will also be implemented. These are char uh, traits of character I very much appreciate. I hope we will see more of it in Swedish politics. But to, for the Prime Minister, now it's time for a new life outside of the world of politics, a life which I hope will contain more time for relaxation, perhaps also, who knows, new habits in the kitchen. I know that one of the Prime Minister's life hack is half-baked pizzas. 
he finishes them in the oven at home to get the perfect finish. Perhaps he will have more time now to make his own pizzas from scratch, or perhaps the oven at home can be updated to ensure that the um, takeout pizza can be really optimal. In any case, we would like, uh, on behalf of my party, to give you some assistance in your uh, making your own pizzas. This is Pizza steel, manufactured and made in Sweden, designed and developed in Norland, a little bit like the Prime Minister himself. And we hope that this will serve a, a good purpose in the future. A warm thank you to you, Stefan Löfven, for everything throughout the years, debates, discussions, collaboration and the care you show others as a fellow human being and as a party leader. Wishing our Prime Minister Stefan Löfven, the best of luck in the future, including using this pizza steel. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Oh. This is a heavy-duty thing, and uh, it will come to good use, I can promise you that. And thank you for the kind words as well. And uh, they're prosecuted. It was difficult uh, initially, that is true, with the report that was to be submitted. And uh, I have regretted this so many times after the fact. Why didn't I accept it? I knew that, well, I had a good argument on the first page. I hadn't really studied it. But anyway, that will be in another life. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the discussions, all the conversations we've had. And we have had the opportunity to get to know each other throughout the years as politicians. And of course, we have different ideologies, different values to a certain extent. But in other respects, we have the same values. And I really appreciate the fact that the Centre Party and Annie Loeff, you are so incredibly clear when it comes to the most important value of them all. And that is the equal value of uh, all human beings. There is nothing that is as important and that you stand up for that, uh, that I really, truly appreciate. We've also had many bilateral discussions and I've uh, appreciated those. And uh, I know I can trust you, Anne to 100 percent. And uh, I'm taking a bit of a li liberty here. <laughs> Apologies to the speaker, uh, but uh, you've truly stood up uh, uh, and uh, participated in that fight. And we have a couple of discussions and um, a couple of months to go. But thank you for this wonderful gift. Thank you. And we continue with Nushi Dadgostar from the left, please. Oh, Stefan. Well, Stefan, it was brief but eventful. So it felt perhaps that it went on for longer than it did, our interactions. I heard what you said in your summer address when you announced that you would be stepping down. You talked of how you grew up in your foster family. In the register, you were 57075G for boy, but with Iris and Ture Melander, you became Stefan instead of a registration number. And here you are today. That is magical. What a journey of life. And it says something about this country. And you did very well. You worked for Heglunds for several years. The ministers are sitting here behind you, of course. But So take this with a pinch of salt. But I looked at the government's CV, and I might have missed someone. But I think you're the only one who's had a proper job, Stefan. And that is something I very much respect. Perhaps that's what we're missing a little bit here in the chamber. Workers. 
And you are an excellent example. And I remember what it was like at the beginning, what it sounded like from the moderate party, because they've uh, made fun of this over and over again. Someone said, a welder, how much of a statesman can that be? I don't think that impressed the voters, that sort of statement. And so I very much enjoyed when you uh, answered Ulf Christensen, and I uh, double-checked this, and you said, now, I'm not an economist. I'm a simple welder, but I do know how to read. You had a deficit left behind. The Social Democrats represented good order in public finances. That was an excellent response. I very much enjoyed that. Now, however... It appears as if your successor will be an economist, but I'm not going to say very much more about that, but a little bit unfortunate, I have to say, that it might be. I, however, would like to welcome you to Gothenburg, uh, where I come from. Not just Gothenburg is turning 400 years, many other towns in various parts of Sweden as well, but Gothenburg, of course, I don't know if it's the municipality or the town or who it was who produced it, but there's an excellent book on Gothenburg that I'm going to present to you, and I hope that you will pay Gothenburg a visit in the future. And here it's both written and shown in pictures how hard people work to build the front of Sweden, as we call it. So my final message is this, Stefan, remember your origins. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As someone who is fierce, well, that is a good description of uh, Nushi. I have to say, have noticed that this last summer, and I'm not going to say thank you for what happened then, but uh, thank you for all the debates that we've had, uh, the talks, the conversations about everything and anything economy now and then, but also wage earners and all your commitment, your work for equality, Noshidatkostar, uh, and also the housing issue. Well, that became very, very obvious, uh, as I've said, what you think there. And I've appreciated these uh, discussions, also not least about uh, equality and wage earners. And uh, maybe that's obvious uh, considering our backgrounds. And I would very much like to go to Göteborg, to Gothenburg, and I uh, appreciate the fact that there you still have a manufacturing industry. It hasn't disappeared. When you go there, you see Eskip, you see Volvo and these nice manufacturing companies, and that is a good feeling. And um, I would want to hear what you have to say about that, says Noshi. There is one problem, and that's the weather. Uh, I've been there once in August uh, when I was the new chair of uh, uh, the Metal Trade Unions Workers Union and uh, had a discussion there saying, how, how are things? Uh, what has the weather been like? It's been unusually good. It only rained twice, uh, the first time for two weeks. And then uh, it stopped for a bit and then it rained for another week. Uh, it's not quite true. I've been to Gothenburg and seen the sun as well, and I actually saw Bruce Springsteen there once, and then the sun was shining, and that was an amazing experience, and I love it to go back. Thank you. Thank you. And we continue with Eva Bush from the Christian Democrats. Herr Tolman. Mr. Speaker, now maybe I will also say do, as it were, uh, to uh, in Swedish. So, but I'm going to try to be positive rather than negative. Anyway, I'd also I'm going to um, pick up where uh, Nushi Dagosa left off. So, I also would like to thank Stefan Löfven for his time as Prime Minister. Arne Geier ha has apparently said that the presidency of the LO is the best job a worker kid can get. Now, and I would maintain that Stefan Levin actually has put, put, put paid to that statement because I would say that the best job that a worker kid can get in Sweden is to become the prime minister and to lead our country. This is a journey, a life journey that Stefan Levin has done from one class to the other. This is social democracy at its best. We have different views about many things. But here, 
here we are able to find each other, as it were, and the aim must always be that everybody should be able to realise their inherent potential. And this, in fact, should be a source of national pride that in Sweden, who becomes the Prime Minister isn't determined by the parents you have, it's instead determined by the, peop the faith that people put in you. And there are a few things, let me say, that have made me so uncomfortable than this propaganda that would like to uh, sort of make it, the Prime Minister's previous job something bad. I think instead we should be proud of the fact that we have a Prime Minister who knows, who really, really knows how growth and exports are created. I'm also pleased to be able to say that even if many have said that I am his main critic, I have never, ever had any reason to mistrust his intentions. In fact, I would say that there are few opposition politicians to have so often had had differing opinions with the government in power, but at the same time never, ever had any reason to mistrust the good intentions of the Prime Minister. Not even in a European context is this no longer something self-evident or given, which is why I'd like, really like to un highlight that here. And I know that there are some citizens of our country who believe that the life as the leader of the government is really the easy life. You know, you have staff, you live in the Sargishka building a manor, you have a car with a chauffeur and gala dinners. But I would like to, I would, I'm sure that Stefan Levin is quite happy to leave all that behind to have more pleasure with his wife and his family. Now, I think this seems to be, there seems to be a slight theme of food, a food theme to all the presents here today, but I have a present in the shape of a dinner for two at restaurant Hilenberg here in Stockholm. We tried to find a restaurant that served traditional Swedish pork pancake. I know that you like that, Prime Minister. However, obviously, we need more entrepreneurs in the restaurant businesses. But Hillenburg have, at least to my mind, the best meatballs in town. And let me say, this dinner for two is not for you and me. No. Actually, I thought that one of my presents actually is for that you can, you know, be rid of me for a change and but once again thank you very very much thank you thanks that minister Prime Minister, well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you so much for your nice words, uh, kind words, and a gift. And there's no doubt uh, that uh, you and I, to a great extent, have different political opinions, but privately, I think that our interests are more similar. I'm thinking about uh, Swedish football. Unfortunately, you picked the wrong team, but um, oh well. I do think that uh, that you can be fully committed in politics and at the same time that you have something in your private life that really interests you, that is good. And, uh, well, a good football game, that is one of the best things for me. And there are two other things I want to say. Firstly, I believe, Ebba Bush, that you were the first to got in touch with me after the terror attacks at uh, Drottninggatan, several party leaders uh, did get in touch. And of course, we had information on an ongoing basis given to everyone. But you were very, very supportive, I can say, in that very difficult moment. And I say thank you for all that support. Secondly, you've also been very uh, clear when it, uh, it comes to issues having to do with LB key to i and I thank you for that as well. Um, and you've said, if you're not with me on this issue, then you have nothing to do in the Christian Democrats. And that's a very clear stance. And I appreciate that. And many, many individuals who truly need that support also appreciate that. So thank you. And uh, thank you for being so clear on many other issues as, as well. And I know that we have differences in opinion, but again, if you take a step back and you start to think about what you really want to accomplish, then I do think that, uh, well, there are many things we can do together in the future, but that will be for someone else. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Tack, godet för replikor. Thank you. And the next rejoinder is Johan Persson from the Liberal Party. Tack, Herr Talman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thought we were going to play the sort of the parcel game, so I took a, a whole pile of them with me. But it is a great deed, really, here that is approaching its end, as it were, here. And from the Liberal Party uh, and uh, Neom Kisobuni, I'd like to thank Stefan Lund for this enormous task that he's managed to do for the nation, Sweden, and for our society. Because I would say that there are many people sitting here uh, you know, who I feel that they are experts, but very few who dare take on that role and receive that trust to lead Sweden in this way. So it is indeed a great deed done, Stefan Löfven. And perhaps you might say, uh, I mean, you can come back in and start working politics again. It's quite important. Maybe you'll come back as an ABBA avatar inspired by your London trip. Who knows? But anyway, you need to rest first. And now we're celebrating 100 years of democracy in Sweden, and therefore it feels like, well, we need books and things. And I've got a book here about liberal women, 100 years working for uh, equal suffrage. I mean, we stood side by side, and Social Democrats and the Liberals, we did on many issues, but here in particular, there's a historic link here. And then we have another top diplomat together with Branting, the previous prime minister, they, when uh, the League of Nations were going to be uh, set up then, I mean, women, this also, I mean, we saw this also in uh, in the state apparatus, as it were. So anyway, these are the first books I'm going to give you. So you can read those first. And then, now, I would also like you and Ulla to eat some nice food. I mean, this is this is more for home this is a, a book about creme brulee, and here we have a burner. So please, I think you should be able to handle that without hurting yourself. But um, bearing in mind the rules, tax rules here in Sweden, uh, even if you did away with the gift tax, the Social Democrats, but I can't, uh, the gas, uh, difficult to buy because it's so expensive. But anyway, you can have to pay for those yourself. Thank you. Minister? Oh. Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is you one person in a nutshell. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And no, 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 I'm not uh, planning a return. You can be calm. And it's not like uh, ABBA. Uh, I do not want to uh, say anything about, about that amazing gang, though. But uh, if you want a good debate, then I have to say that then you're to debate with uh, you and person. You never know what will be being said, uh, but there's always a good foundation for what you're saying, something you believe in, something you stand up for, something that is important. But you can say these uh, things in a very clever and unpredictable way, if I put it like that. And I don't know if you've been spying on me, uh, possibly, uh, to see what my private life is like. Definitely not, uh, says uh, Johan Persson. But uh, creme brulee, as a matter of fact, that is my wife Ulla's uh, favorite dessert, uh, so she will love you. And... Uh, as a matter of fact, when we go out for dinner, we always check that there is a cream brulee because you need that for a proper dinner. So this was right on spot. Thank you. Thank you, you and Person, for everything uh, here and uh, elsewhere. And um, regards uh, to Nyanko Sabuni, I truly appreciate those uh, discussions as well. Didn't uh, happen what I had hoped for with the January agreement, but I appreciate uh, the discussions, the talks uh, we have had. Thank you. Thank you. And the next uh, rejoinder will be uh, Marta Stenevi from the Green Party. Well, if you come after Johan Persson, you have to press this button. Anyway, Mr. Speaker, I've only met you and worked together with you for a very short period of time. 
and but it's been seven very uh, very um, up uh, up people months. There's been a, a government crisis, and through all this, you have showed very clearly uh, what your latest addition to your CV is, and that is you were prime minister. A strong leader, strong leadership, characterized by all we've seen in all these seven years that we've uh, worked together, the Greens and you, through the terror attack, through the increasing climate crisis, and not least also through the pandemic that we have been through this country and still are at the end of. Together, our parties have achieved a great deal. We've had very difficult negotiations, two parties, different parties in negotiations, but we have achieved a great deal and we are on the way to becoming the first fossil fuel free country, as promised. We've had prominent uh, heads of government in peacetime, in, during wartime, and I'm sure that you will be one of our most important leaders of government in a period of crisis. So I'd like to thank you for that. Now, hopefully, you'll have a lot more time to do other things. And now there is this food theme that we've seen today. And I've got points of view about uh, sort of how much choice you have in Stockholm and also uh, access, as it were, to spettekaka, the traditional Scanian uh, dessert. So we, I'd like you to come to Malmö and to visit and walk about Malmö here. But anyway, we have given you an interrail uh, card, so you can take a train to the UK and see some football if you want. But also, I mean, if Tottenham, for example, were able to play in the Champions League, maybe going to Malmo is enough, you know, when they meet the world's best team, MFF, the Malmo team. But anyway, once again, thank you very, very much. And there's a spetakaka waiting for you in Malmo when you pass by. And there's a, a lot of fantastic countryside to walk around in. And I wish you all the best in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I really appreciate going to Skåne. I'll be very happy to actually plan it for uh, September, but maybe we have to delay it a little bit. And I'm looking forward to the spettekaka as uh, well. And uh, I'm now thinking about restaurants uh, in uh, Stockholm. This is our capital, and there is no spettekapa, and there is no Swedish pork pancake. Mm -hmm. That might be something we have to do something about. But uh, anyway, uh, thank you, and uh, I'll see you again already tomorrow when we have uh, our meeting in the government. But, uh, well, of course, we're not done, but we have accomplished a lot. And uh, we have had a difficult situation, yes. Uh, but I want to say thank you to Marta Stenevi in particular for your uh, commitment and all your hard work. And we have to stand up and be clear about uh, the fact that we have two different genders, but men and women do have to have equal opportunities uh, at home, out in society, everywhere, and also at work. It simply has to be, or we will not use everyone's full capacity. And this is something that you have been very clear about. Thank you, and thank you for these wonderful gifts. Yeah, that made that uh, concludes the rejoinders uh, to the Prime Minister's address, and we continue with our speakers list, where the next uh, speaker is uh, Ulf Christensen from the Moderate Party. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So back to the every to the nitty gritty. 
Now, our country has a unique possibility to take the lead in the global climate transition. There are few countries that have the same good energy and industrial prerequisites as Sweden does. Trade and industry is a becoming Sweden's new green movement. But this government, I think, has wasted this hope for the future, because year after year, Sweden seriously fails to achieve its climate goals. The government wants fossil-free electricity but phases out nuclear power, wants industry to transition but does not shorten permit processes or do away with the red tape, wants electric cars but does not invest in charging infrastructure, we want batteries but doesn't, will not mine minerals or open new mines, and the government wants to build new houses out of wood but not manage the forest. There is no strategy here in their approach to climate and environmental policy. Now the government, or let us be perfectly honest, the Green Party, has its sights set on the Swedish forestry sector. That is their next line of attack. However, forests, our forests are an invaluable resource, both as regards binding carbon dioxide, but also for creating sustainable products. And over 100,000 Swedes work in the forestry sector. The irony is that it's the Green Party and the European Union that are now the two biggest threats against Swedish, the Swedish forestry sector. The Proberos will take control of 525,000 hectares of forest, an area the size of the whole of Westmanland has not been withdrawn. On the contrary, two days ago, Per Bolund presented a budget item that seemed to point at them continuing with the greatest wave of taking control of forest and land in modern times. However, there is a large majority against that. And soon, Mr. Speaker, we'll see the answer. Will Green Party maintain their threat to take control of more forest land? Thank you. Thank you. The following have requested a rejoinder. Stefan Levien, Nushidad Koska and Mata Sinri. First, the Prime Minister, please. Mr. Speaker, more or less at the same time as when democracy was introduced fully here, a revolution, I think, thought came into being that society had to take the responsibility for the most vulnerable in society. That was the first few steps taken towards the development of the uh, welfare state, giving a foster child like me the same opportunities in school as the doctor's son giving everyone the same potential and for health care. I'm a social democrat because I know that freedom for each and every one of us requires a strong society shouldering the responsibility uh, for all of us. Over the past few decades, we've seen threats to the welfare society and threats to equality. Um, citizens become customers, uh, profit comes before the general interest in society. And my question to Will Christensen is if you perceive the same problems from the moderate party. Mr. Speaker, I do share the view that when the state took over more the responsibility, I mean, this came from sort of church uh, parishes, then the municipalities, and then state. And I worked many years to support uh, welfare, our welfare society, and I support uh, our, so, so our history, social history, they, these are the people, uh, Mudal, etc., who built up our welfare state. But I think that perhaps we also need to ensure that we create the resources that the welfare state needs in order to be able to distribute them to people that need this. And I'm sure that the work uh, theme is, in fact, the most important thing. And we want a society where most people work and support themselves. That kind of society is a society that can afford and the ability also to help those who can't help themselves. And if you start questioning this, that it's not jobs that's the most important thing, then I also become afraid that you actually undermine our welfare systems. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, work is a prerequisite for welfare. There's absolutely no question about that. That's a social democratic, very clear stance. But here, there's another matter of ideology at play, which is to say uh, that the uh, needs of the individual, of every individual's uh, possibilities require 
as a backdrop, a strong society. And I hear from the right wing side in politics that the market experiment has been taken too far. We hear some mention of that. Perhaps there were good intentions to uh, improve our welfare uh, state generally, but uh, we've seen the opposite in many cases, uh, mainly because citizens are no longer perceived as citizens, but rather clients or customers, and that the interest in making a profit is allowed to uh, triumph over the general interest in society. And that's where I would like uh, a common approach, because otherwise it's not going to be accessible to everyone, the welfare of ours. Mr. Speaker, on this sort of um, we, on this day, perhaps we should just question our methods rather than our views as such. I think the thing is that we miss sometimes the risks if we don't follow up your own reforms. For example, taking early retirement, that reform, we need that. I mean, half a million of early people in early retirement. No, we couldn't have that at all. That's a different thing. We need to reform a system which might run amok. And to have a public welfare system, that's good. But to have a, a public monopoly in this way is not good, Where because entrepreneurs can, in fact, uh, do good in the welfare sector. And so this isn't just sort of doing away with the obligation and duty to pursue every reform, because there's no reform that doesn't leave room for er error. There's always a risk when you make a change. So you need to ensure, do all schools deliver, private and public? Do they deliver the knowledge that pupils have the right to? Every home for the elderly, every nursing home, do they deliver the care that, they, that the elderly needs? Is the answer no? Then you need to make changes. Thank you. That's the end of that round of rejoinders. Next, we have Nushi Dadgosa from the left party, please. Yeah, I told mom. Mr. Speaker, Ulf Christensen, in the previous round of rejoinders, talked about social insurance, and he's been a minister responsible for social insurance, so he's well familiar with the policies of the moderate party in that area. And he mentioned during his address the issue of uh, uh, that matter. One of the most important points he stated is the need to reduce, make it worse, make it more difficult to be granted sickness insurance and unemployment benefit money. Uh, if I've understood it correctly. Now, the government has introduced a number of improvement proposals in the world of uh, OECD countries. We have the worst performing system currently in Sweden. So I'd like to hear from the former social insurance minister, who was the architect, in fact, behind the social insurance system we currently have in this country. What additional changes would the moderate party uh, propose to make to the sickness insurance? How much more do we reduce the compensation levels in the insurance uh, scheme? Thank you, Thomas. Nay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. No, that's not the case. That Anybody is proposing deteriorations or decreases. No, what we're proposing is systems that are sustainable so that people who work, they earn a living, they pay tax taxes and they get the welfare system to work so that those who need it then can benefit from it. That's what we're after. When I came into the government uh, 10 years ago, we did try to work with the system and do something where we had a half a million people who'd taken her early retirement and twice as many on sick leave as other countries. And this was Joran Paschal's insight, the goal to halve. That's what he said before he left power. We can't have a system with so many people on sick leave who are on sick leave for such a long period of time because that, of course, undermines our welfare system. And this was an insight broadly. I'm not quite sure that left party agreed at that time, but nearly everybody else realized this. And then we had reforms that we introduced so that people would work rather than be off uh, for too long periods of time. And I'm proud of those reforms. Hi. Thank you. Nushi Dadgoska. Mr. Speaker, I know two of the uh, people who've ended up in a conflict situation with the social insurance uh, office, two individuals suffering from uh, severe cases of cancer. We hear over and over again that people with uh, severe illnesses uh, lose their entitlements 
In addition, you're proposing additional qualifying days and periods, to, uh, and you want to make savings to the tune of 10 billion in the social insurance scheme. Together with the Christian Democrats, you've taken additional proposals to introduce the um, final deadline in the scheme where you lose all your entitlements and to carry out even tougher controls on those who apply for uh, support. And we know that the rejection rate is currently higher than ever, in fact. So this is important information to the Swedish people today from Ulf Kristersson. The Moderate Party are looking to make savings of another 10 billion to deteriorate further and decrease the compensation. Or how else should I understand the proposals you've tabled? Mr. Speaker, the left party should understand that like this. the time limits are important in an insurance which the aim, very aim is to get back into work. And these qualifying diets are also necessary in an insurance scheme. All countries with advanced social insurance systems know that we need this. Either you, get, you come back to your job or you can't, if you can't work any longer, then you need to take early retirement. That's how it should work. I have so many times sat with people in the social services and the social insurance office, and I understand how difficult their job is. They have the regulations to follow, the rules. All countries have rules, and they need to be interpreted. And sometimes, of course, there's a conflict and onkid with one individual insured person or person who's marginalised. And then, of course, we have the courts to determine, to create justice and appeal is this correct or not? Now, if the polit political sphere isn't satisfied, then we can change, make changes. But politicians have no limits, no rules, no controls, no time limits. That politician will undermine both our welfare system and our economy. Thank you. Thus, that's the end of that round of rejoinders. Next, we have Meta Stianovi from the left party, please. Uh, from the Greens, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I listened with great interest uh, and uh, read with great interest the uh, article published by the Monday Party on their proposed new climate policy. Unfortunately, it wasn't a blockbuster, indeed. It was a bit like when I studied literature uh, and read uh, the Godot play, the classic by Beckett. You read and you read and you read, but you never see any climate policy occur. But please uh, don't uh, misinterpret me. No one would uh, like to uh, not have a global car CO2 tax. But while we're waiting for this tax that everyone can accept, emissions are going up. What about your time frame? That's what I would like to ask of Christesson. What measures would the moderate party like to see introduced here and now to reduce Sweden's emissions by, say, 10 to 15 percent per year, which is what is required right now, because we've been uh, lagging behind for so long and not taking action? Is there anything you'd like to do now rather than later? Well, Christesson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Sometimes I get the impression that the Green Party, when you set your goals and then fail seriously, for example, that when you know, fail to achieve our own climate goals by that, then it's not it's not about the politics. It's that is you want to make the goals even stricter. But the reality doesn't become better if you you set your sights higher than never get anywhere. It's the climate change is an urgent matter, but it's also for the long term. It's national, local, international, European. Had we had you not phased out nuclear power as you so wished then we would have fewer emissions in Sweden, and that would have made a gain, environmental gain internationally. And the, in the United States, for example, after these terrible years with Trump, now with the, with the EU and the US, we can together try to get China to uh, work for the environment proper. That's fantastic. I don't think that this sort of nationalism is important at all here. We need to do the right thing here in Sweden to inspire other countries to do the right thing. Then that's how we can benefit the world most. Thank you. Thank you, Talman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's often very interesting to listen to what Old Christensen says, but it's even more interesting to listen to and pay attention to what he doesn't say. The policies he doesn't mention in a climate policy debate. We have forest fires across the globe from California to Australia. The moderate party would like to reduce the petrol tax. 
awaiting, pending a global CO2 tax. And while floodings torment Sweden, Europe and the world, Ulf Christensen doesn't even have the energy to give us a deadline, a final time frame for when we end fossil fuels. In the EU, the moderate parties say no to introduce some of the measures that have been produced. They talk about objectives but and symbols in politics. This is a typical example. Anything that can be reduced here and now is left in the hands of someone else somewhere else, possibly waiting for a good all. But if we take the 2035 target, my question remains, what is your time frame to achieve the targets you mentioned in the article you published? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, I think it's a bit much really to say that the person who's today responsible for Swedish climate policy and for and has been for a number of years now and time and time again failed to achieve its own goals is pointing at other finger at the other countries who want to do things more efficiently. I think that's going too far. And I think it's pretty obvious that if Sweden does the right thing with our very low level of sort of share of emissions globally, then if we can get others to be inspired by, for example, get the United States and China in on this, then we're doing a great deal. But we're not going to do it by destroying things for people who live in the Swedish countryside, for example, who can't afford to buy a new electric car, for example, and they can't even charge it anyway. And so my question is, why can't you build the right charging infrastructure so the people who do want to drive an electric car is able to, are able to charge their cars? Thank you. Tack. Det får vi se som en retorisk fråga. That was a rhetorical question, I think, because that's the end of that round of rejoinders. And that's also the end of all the questions put to uh, Ulf Kristersson. Next, we have Jimmy Åkesson for his two-minute speech, please. Jimmy Åkesson from the Sweden Democrats. Mr. Speaker, our time on earth, our moment in time, was Stefan Löfven's theme for today's address here in the chamber. And he also noted, or he stated, in fact, that he knows what he has spent his time doing. Unfortunately, so do we, at least when in reference to the past seven years. That's part of the problem, after all. Stefan Löfven also uh, mentions the fact that society was created by man. And uh, there's some truth to that. And it was one person in particular who uh, did this, the Prime Minister. It's not the auxiliary nurse in the Malcolm elderly care facility who's responsible for what society looks like right now, nor is it the police officer in Rosengård, a suburb of Malmö, who's responsible for what this uh, uh, society looks like, or the scaffolding builder in Mala who's responsible, or a hard-working Husby hairdresser not responsible for the way our, our society looks like. As a prime minister, you cannot put the responsibility on everyone else's shoulders. Mr. Speaker, Stefan Löfven is responsible for what our society looks like. That is a fact. Regular, ordinary, hard-working Swedes are not to be blamed for the society Stefan Löfven and his social democratic government has created over the seven years they've been in power. And this is why, Mr. Speaker, it is essential now, with an election coming up in just uh, over a year, we will have a new cap, a new direction for Sweden. With common sense, Sweden needs a new government. Thank you. Thank you. St Prime Minister Stefan Löfven of the Social Democrats, Annie Löv, Nushida Gustav, and Johan Persson, and Marta Stenevi have requested rejoinders to uh, Jimmy Åkesson's address. Prime Minister. Mr. 
Mr. Speaker, democracy is under threat in many places around the world. There are few people today that are living in a democracy than there were 10 years ago. S Swedish democracy is based in our constitution, so it's not just the government there, but also that is protected, but also our values and our rights that democracy rests on, our rights and equality, respecting our differences and that uh, equal opportunities should prevail. Human rights, etc. These are is so important, and we can't have one thing and not the other. And the same applies to, a, and we can't survive a right-wing extreme ideology that wants to say we and them, leading to intolerance, word by for word, step by step. Jimmy Orkson, can't you see what? your friends, pals are doing in the rest of the world. Is this the type of development you wish to see here in Sweden? Thank you. Jimmy Okerson. Mr. Speaker, now for almost seven years now, I've been listening to the conspiracy theories presented by Stefan Löfven on how we're governed by dark forces globally and internationally who would like to see the downfall of democracy and making make things miserable for people everywhere uh, around the globe. And most people do understand, of course, that this is not uh, something that tallies with reality. These are conspiracy theories. If there's anything threatening democracy in this country, it's the eroding of this rule of law that has been paved way for by the Social Democrats. Political violence by left-wing and right-wing extremists have been... Uh, guilty of in one election campaign after another, if there's one thing that threatens democracy, it's social democrats, rather, who want to uh, have, remain in power at all cost. They refuse to uh, relinquish even one inch, and this is dangerous. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Jimmy Orkerson could have said something about how, how, how he sees developments in Hungary and Poland, where LGBT people, for example, are no longer as free. We have courts are no longer free. But he chose not to say anything about that. And the view of the democracy is based on values. And those values had traditionally been accepted by all parties in this Riksdag in this chamber. But a, a party who in its manifesto says that people are defined by their biological inheritance, as it were, and making it and making a distinguishing between people and people. And they therefore are not upholding the values according to Swedish law and the Swedish constitution. We need hu human rights because these other views, they undermine our democracy. That threat is for real. But it's good if the Sweden Democrats could step back from that, please. Thank you. Jimmy Okus on final rejoinder. Mr. Speaker, of course, I can talk of any number of countries across the globe. But I fail to understand why I should do this. Because Stefan Löfven uh, is of the opinion that I should do so. Do so? No. I don't think I need to do that. Stefan Levin, strawman that he paints when he says that we're getting our inspiration from countries who in various ways uh, democratically appear to be going in the wrong direction. This is not something that I reasonably needs to talk about just because Stefan Levin is of that opinion. That's up to Stefan Levin to do. I also see the Unfortunate, unpleasant development we see in certain countries. There are a number of countries that are controlled by right-wing parties and a number of other ones controlled by the end of the political spectrum that Stefan Löfven belongs to. And I do not welcome such developments. On the contrary, I believe in democracy. I believe in our constitution. And I believe in Sweden, the way it's developed uh, across generations. And I have absolutely no intention of making fundamental changes to that. On the contrary. Thank you. This concludes this round of rejoinder. Annie Love of the Centre Party has the next rejoinder. Herr <coughs> Tolman. 
Mr. Speaker, the Centre Party has uh, introduced a number of proposals to strengthen the protection of our liberal democracy, to strengthen the, discrimin uh, the Constitution, for example, and uh, the work against discrimination. But we see the Sweden Democrats wanting other types of change altogether. You wrote uh, last year that the Constitution should start uh, with uh, a writing saying that the power should start uh, with the, the Swedish uh, people. You want to change the culture, you want to ensure that the pride flag cannot flag, fly from uh, public buildings. And uh, you want to look at who is Swedish, who belongs to the Swedish population or not. And this is uh, to reduce the rights of the minorities uh, so that the majority can oppress a minority. And maybe that is what you want to accomplish when you want to change our constitution. Looking at what you said and wrote last year, or could you explain why this uh, would be necessary to define in the Constitution what the Swedish people is? Mr. Speaker, it's almost a satire or parody, if you ask me. When a party has as an election promise that you change the Constitution to enable... Uh, to ensure that no other party can make changes or amendments to the Constitution. I don't see how this rhymes well with democracy. I also don't understand the central parties, uh, the center party's request for a constitutional court. I don't know how democracy will be strengthened by civil servants reassessing the uh, decisions made in the Swedish Riksdag by those elected by the people. For example, Annie Löv and the Centre Party carries the same responsibility as Stefan Löfven for the eroding of the rule of law. All uh, our entire liberal democracy is based on the principle of rule of law and uh, the fact that every citizen is, uh, has the same rights before a court of law. There are examples in Centre Party members in our courts who are making uh, rulings and judgments based on uh, ethnic. Uh, belonging of orientation rather than uh, other features. This is a threat. Mr. Speaker, this is uh, truly uh, concerning what we hear Jimmy Okerson says. He doesn't understand the importance of uh, defending basic human values and rights. The proposals that we have presented from the Centre Party for many years, uh, they're very similar to what we have from other right-wing parties. It's about the basic principles of defending citizens' rights. Let me quote the Sweden Democrats and the proposal from last year about minorities where it says that you can read uh, that the public service is uh, to promote Swedish culture in Sweden and uh, that uh, immigrants in Sweden should be assimilated, not integrated. And let me ask you again, why is this so important that you changed the Swedish constitution where you wanted to, to have as a starting point the Swedish people and where you want to limit the rights of uh, the minorities? And why do you want to prevent the pride flag from flying? Thanks. I find that rejoined. Mr. Speaker, drafting something about individual flags in the Constitution appears very strange indeed, but that's not the point here. The point, Mr. Speaker, is that Annie Love fails to understand what society looks like. Annie Love is opposed to the idea of having people coming from everywhere across the globe adapting and becoming part of the Swedish society. Rather, entirely based on the new liberal approach taken by Annie Love, be able to live exactly as you like, comply with any norms or values or laws that you prefer when you're here in Sweden. I don't believe in that. I think we see the result of that model of society here. We have divisions, segrega uh, segregation, parallel societies growing. We have to ensure that people who live in Sweden also accept and respect basic norms and values which have built our society across generations. This is where we have differences of opinion, my party and Annie Love's party. Thank you. This concludes the, this round of rejoinder. Noshi Dadgostar of the left party has the floor for the next round of rejoinders. Mr. Speaker, 
the Sweden Democrats have said that they want to see Ulf Christensen as a prime minister in Sweden and that they are willing to give their full support to the moderate leader so that he can lead the country. And we know that his track record is basically about doing away with the sick pay and the unemployment benefits. That is one of the most important agenda items for the moderate leader. The Sweden Democrats have also been very active when it comes to the sick health care insurance that we have where you want those who are suffering from illness to pay higher taxes. You've said that here in the chamber and you want to do away with the time limits that we have and you voted for the moderate leader's proposal that will really worsen the system and you also want uh, commercial actors to be able to make money from elderly living in uh, old people's homes and uh, what you say and uh, what you do in the chamber well those things do not seem to match Mr. Speaker, well, I think the final question will be answered by others. Uh, I obviously have the uh, opposing opinion. If there's any party in this chamber who have been working hard to ensure that the those exposed in our society are giving a more dignified uh, life and existence, it's the Sweden Democrats, in fact. I'd like to correct Noshi Dadgastar on a couple of points. One is that we did not express any support for any individual prime minister uh, in any way whatsoever. Secondly, we have never stated that we give our complete and unabiding support to any candidate for the position as prime minister. Just like the left party, the Sweden Democrats have, we have our own political priorities. And the more votes for a party like the Sweden Democrats, the more of uh, our policies are likely going to get support. And if you vote for the Sweden Democrats, you'll have a party who will fight for a generous um, transition support system, unemployment benefit scheme, a party fighting for an ins uh, in uh, sickness insurance, which is a reasonable balance compared to the resources of society. Uh, Mr. Speaker, well... Uh this uh, cannot be right. Uh, we must have different experiences. Uh, what is happening in the chamber is that you're voting for those uh, proposals uh, to uh, do away with parts of the sickness, the health insurance, uh, and you have not uh, voted in favor of uh, disbanding the pension group. And that was discussed in committee. Then you did not vote for it. It was just the center party doing so. And uh, this is a party that uh, you're F totally following the moderate party. And again and again, you vote for those proposals uh, that uh, will worsen conditions uh, in sickness insurance. So you have uh, made uh, your own proposals in that direction as well. And uh, we know what it usually sounds like. First, you should not be in favor of commercial actors uh, making money from old people in old people's homes. But then you're supposed to. So you say one thing and you do something else. Jimmy Åkesson. Madam Speaker, that uh, Nushi Dadgustar and I don't share the same perceptions of reality is no surprise. We belong to completely different parties with entirely different visions for what society should look like in the longer term. And I'm very grateful for that when it comes to the left party, not least. Welfare is a central feature. It is decisive for how we construct our society. And I include sickness insurance, pensions for the retired, and I include the ben uh, unemployment benefit scheme because it's part of the safety net we construct in society to ensure that people who end up in unemployment, who fall ill, or who've worked uh, so that they're worn out after a long working life to build and contribute to building the society can have a dignified and uh, plentiful Retirement. Though these are our priorities. For Nushi Dadgastar to read other things into our policies is up to her. It's not what we represent. This concludes this round of rejoinders. Johan Passion of the Liberal Party is uh, next for this round of rejoinders. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
this last set of rejoinders, well, I have to say that during this legislature, we've had a functioning collaboration. Well, we had the January agreement that was entered into by four political parties after a very difficult electoral uh, result, and then uh, that uh, was uh, did away with uh, by Jimmy Orkison and Nushi Dagestar. But now you're no longer friends, obviously. Uh, but uh, I'm happy that Jimmy Orkison and the Sweden Democrats that you want to strengthen Sweden's pensions. I want to ask how I've understood that you want to safeguard the pensions group that was started when we phased out the old pyramid scheme, if I may call it that, and started a new uh, system instead. And uh, then, well, we had COVID, people who live longer because they stopped uh, smoking, drinking, etc. But what is your plan when it comes to the pension scheme? Thank you, Jimmy Åkesson. Thank you, Tolman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for a seriously intended question. It's interesting to have an actual topical debate, well, not a debate perhaps, but at least a campaign of information. What's uh, decisive for me is for our elderly, the people who are retired, who is going to be the retirees of the future, we are given better living conditions. That's decisive to me. How this is, uh, co how this comes about is a little bit less important. It could be what we propose in our what we propose in our budget bill that we allocate more in contributions to the pension system. That's one way of doing it. There is likely a majority for that measure in Swedish Riksdag, uh, with the exception of the pension work working group who've made a certain proposals. You can reduce taxes. You can do it in different ways. And I'm open for a discussion on different approaches and methods. The important thing for me is to ensure that a person who's been working hard all their lives are giving financial conditions that are reasonable when it's time to retire. Thank you. Johan Persson of the Liberals. Talman. Uh Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, uh, the system that we have today, it's based on the fact uh, that we have a basic state pension that's uh, related to for how long you've been working. And then you have the occupational pension that is also quite important and we could uh, change things there as well, of course. And we would like to see more people paying into that because we know that uh, people today are not getting the pension that the, they have uh, actually worked for. And we usually have, we used to, to have a system where you could uh, save and if you started early, you got quite a bit. But now we have this uh, new so-called ISK account and uh, it doesn't seem like the government right now, unfortunately, is too interested in doing something. And uh, of course, we could work with tax reductions. And actually, we are pleased with what we did during the January agreement because we helped the pensioners. And is that what we should do? Or should we take from the so-called ATP funds? Or what should we do? But it is important to, to discuss this. We have to understand that pensions, as is today, are not enough. Jimmy Åkesson. Madam Speaker. The relevant point for us is not exactly how we go about doing this. We believe that the best way of doing this is for the government to step in. As we propose, we want to uh, move some of the contributions covered by the state to strengthen the pension system, not along the lines of what the Social Democrats have proposed, that this is something that's going to be allocated to the employers by social uh, employers' charges to be increased. But I know, I'm open for various proposals. I want to strengthen and improve the pensions and the living conditions for our elderly, for our pensioners. It's extremely important, not least considering that more and more people are becoming of that uh, into that age bracket. Thank you. Marta Stenevi is next for a round of rejoinders. You have the floor. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. A few weeks ago, we got the proposals from the criminal gang crime in investigation. And uh, we have also seen proposals from the government about increased punishments. But nevertheless, we hear that people are frustrated. Police, civil society, social services, they are frustrated. And long-term efforts have put to be made within schools, social services, and other important parts of society. That was a quote. And I do understand that uh, the Sweden Democrats would like proposals like having the army uh, 
involved in uh, fighting crime in the suburbs. And this is uh, symbol politics that you're talking about, but it's not enough. And my question is, what does uh, the Sweden Democrats actually want to do in concrete terms to decrease vulnerability among children and stop recruiting children into gang crime. Jimmy Åkesson. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Let me say, first of all, that I'm pleased to hear that the Green Party have started to take these issues seriously. Historically, they failed to do so. They pretended that uh, they didn't exist, but now suddenly you're identifying them. I'm pleased to see that, and I'm happy to see more of an awareness of the actual realities of life. Marta Stianovi points out that the government has raised the... uh, sanctions for 50 different offences. That's excellent, but it's not the sanctions in reality that are increased. It's the minimum levels that have been raised. The bar is raised. But but it tends to have more of an impact at the other end of the scale. So if most people are sentenced according to the minimum requirements, it doesn't matter if you st- uh, strengthen the the sanctions we're going to have to focus mainly on the minimum because din- dangerous people need to stay locked up. They shouldn't be moving around freely in society. Dangerous individuals should be in prison. And you can resolve this if you see reality as it is. Marta Stenevi? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation of uh, the de minimis penalties. But that was not my question. My question was what you wanted to do. We have these uh, children that were born in Sweden, grew up in Sweden. And what are we going to do so that they do not join uh, criminal gangs? And what do you want to do so that we have an equitable school across the country for way too long? The Sweden Democrats, you have gotten away with just blaming everything on immigration. You talk about culture. But we have a fact that young people are dying in our streets and mothers are mourning their sons. And you have no concrete political proposals to fight crime long term. You're just uh, talking about being tougher against immigration. Jimmy Åkesson. Madam Speaker, well, here is the confirmation that the Green Party is a left-wing extremist party. They're blinded by the so-called socioeconomic factors and fail to see that there are other... uh, methods to explain why people go move into serious crime. Poverty and social exclusion will lower the bar, of course, for the threshold for ending up in a, a criminal uh, environment. I accept that, but it's not the entire explanation. Another component is the fact that a society which places no requirements or demands on people, people who come here from other parts of the country, who unfortunately constitute a majority of those who belong to gangs, uh, almost the totality, in fact. They've never been requested to become part of the Swedish society, never been asked to. Not e- That's another problem. And yet another issue is the fact that we fail to forcefully combat the less serious types of crime that many young uh, people, youths, children, choose to and are attracted to. If you'd like to discuss that, I'm very happy to discuss that. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes this round of rejoinders. And all uh, rejoinders uh, on Jimmy Okerson's address. Now the floor uh, goes to Annie Love for her second address. Fru <coughs> Talman, klimatet. Madam Speaker, the climate, jobs, safety, security, rural areas, these are topics where we will continue to work for change. We're going to do everything we can for our political proposals so that we can bring the country forward and to build so that we get the greener, stronger, safer Sweden. That is something that is based on liberal democracy, and this is something that we've taken for granted for way too long. But this is something we need to strengthen and defend every day. We see today how uh, we see more oppression, insecurity, and we hear uh, the voice of uh, human rights uh, being um, done away with. And we now hear talk about limiting the freedom of the press, expression, uh, polarizing courts, etc. And we also hear the applause and uh, 
the uh, admirers uh, saying that this is a good idea. We see strong forces being inspired, regardless whether it's uh, the Trump movement in the U.S. or Viktor Orban in Hungary. And this is an anti-liberal movement that we see in the world today, and we cannot stay naive. Our Swedish democracy is strong, but we need to do everything we can to safeguard it for the future. And we have a number of proposals for protecting our liberal democracy. We want to strengthen the protection for free, independent media. We want to make it more difficult to, to change the Swedish constitution. And we want to look at our Supreme Courts and what is being done there. And we want to have uh, those... Uh, testings of uh, what is happening in Supreme Courts that is uh, not political. And we wanted to fight for openness, uh, knowledge and uh, f justice. And we want to create the opportunities that we need across uh, the country. Thank you. And the following have asked for rejoinders, Noshi Dadgostar and uh, Marta Stanevi. And uh, we will begin with uh, Noshi Dadgostar. Madam Speaker, now the Centre Party did start this new Prime Minister period by uh, saying that there was a ban on talking, as it were, vis-à-vis -vis the Prime Minister. He was not going to be allowed to talk to, with about his own budget, uh, sort of uh, about his budget. But my question to Annie Love is: Aren't politics? I mean, politics really has to do with compromising we can't all gain everything but everyone can get something if we are allowed to speak to each other and talk to each other and talk to each other and agree and then we can sort of stand for that compromise now i'm not interested in hearing about how uh, polit our politics are different you the center party me the left party but anila can you understand the criticism that we've I mean, there's massive criticism against you, really, because we're, we must be able to speak to each other in politics. Sometimes you just have to get along with the idea that you can't gain everything, but we have to try to get come to an agreement. Madam Speaker, yesterday, Nushidat Gostar said the following. The, this is a suicide pact to work together with the Centre Party. And the last few years, Nushidat Gostar and the left party have been very clear about this, that uh, you have a neoliberal policy, that, uh, is, uh, that our policy is uh, something that is neoliberal and that should be done away with. But Nushidat Gostar, there is no ban on talking or negotiating. Stefan Levin can negotiate with whomever he wants to. And uh, you seem to be okay with the working together with the Sweden Democrats. So you lost all your principles. You were willing to work with the Sweden Democrats to do away with a social Democrat government. And uh, this is about the ability to cooperate. And it's about being able to negotiate when you're close to each other in your opinions, because uh, that is how politics works. And we're prepared to work with the uh, parties here. And uh, please go ahead. Uh, Thank you, Madam Speaker. But I would say that you are putting yourself upon others by doing that. Annie Love, she can get everything, but everybody else should just shut up in the boat. But, of course, we can't see the world like that, can we? I mean, we are different. We've got different political parties. We want different things. But at the same time, we must be able to sit down and talk to each other. It can't be the case that, Annie Love, you actually mean that this is how we should govern Sweden. Prime Minister sitting in his tower, believing that he knows roughly what the parties down there feel and think, and perhaps has his budget voted through Parliament. Annie Love, is this how we should govern Sweden? Uh, no to talking, no to negotiations, no to certain parties. Is this Sweden's future? Is this the Centre Party's vision? because it's not going to work. It's much easier to come to an agreement if you sit down and talk to each other. Thank you, Annie Love, the Centre Party, please. 
Nej, det är inte fram. No, that is not the future for the center party. We have been there in all agreements between the political parties the last few years, and for many years we have been there involved in negotiating, getting results, also so that we could get this government. And also when it comes to the budget, that is in our DNA to take responsibility. and. Uh, there were many liberal reforms that were part of the general agreement where we had agreed that we would continue. But we have a principle not to, to work with a xenophobic party, and you voted in favor of uh, that vote of no confidence. And that is why we now have this very difficult year, because we have that vote of no confidence government. and. Here we have a foundation for the work in the Swedish Riksdag, which is to be able to negotiate, and that is also what we will focus on. That concludes that uh, set of rejoinders, uh, and we continue with Marta Stenevi from the Green Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I just have a very Quick question for Annie Love. In your first address today, and also in previous communication this week, Annie Love, you've spoken that you want a fair uh, protection of our shorelines. Now, what does a fair protection mean to you, Annie Love, and the Centre Party? Are we talking about fair as in, you know, access to the environment, regardless of your wealth, uh, or is it fair as in? that we sort of limit this freedom to roam? Or is it fair for those who can afford it? Uh, whereas it's unfair for those who are shut out of it, as it were. Centre party, please. Very good question. Madam Speaker, that's a very good question. Sh fair protection of shorelines. It's about differentiating so that we have freedom for everyone who lives there. And we also want to make the natural environment available for people, but it's also about being able to refurbish an industry in the countryside just as you can in the city, because today you get a no if you have such a request for refurbishment. It should be possible to have a company, run a company also in rural areas. and. Uh, what we want to do is that we want to continue with the shore protection investigation. We want to look at what areas need to be protected. And we also want to have freedom so that you can build close to a small lake, for example. And it should also be possible to have different types of activities. Matta Stenevi, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Naturally, there are situations where we can agree that perhaps it should be easier to, to build sort of on industrial land that's polluted, for example. We've done this, seen example, good examples of this in Malmö, in the Malmö region, we could use elsewhere in the country, for example, where dams and other places where we could, in fact, develop these areas, this land, much more. But I'm just wondering about who is going to be doing the building and the developing, who's going to be, can afford to build on land which is on a shore. I mean, for example, in Stockholm, I mean, 70% of the shores and the coasts in Dundon have been shut off. Is that really something that's more fair if we see it across country? Well, it's only the person who can afford to buy this land that has access to the coast, to the shoreline. Is that your fairness? Because what you're talking about is a stronger ownership right, but not necessarily a fairer system. Thank you. Annie Love. Madam Speaker, Marta Stenevi needs to travel across the country to see what the situation is actually like, also in the rural areas. For example, we have many more lakes than inhabitants, and we have a shore line in Sweden where we can do a lot. I think we should 
safeguard the right to roam freely. That is something that is important, and also the biological diversity, and that you can have access to shores. All these things are important, but there are so many examples, and this is something that is really frustrating, that Stockholm, the Riksdag, does not see the possibilities that we have in the rural areas to have industry companies to run a bed and breakfast. We have to ensure that we have a more equitable system where we have a fair shoreline protection across the country. And that concludes uh, that set of rejoinders, and we continue with uh, the next address. And uh, the next speaker is Nushi Dagastar from the left. Madam Speaker, this government has been so busy with its own dealings and its own hobby horses that they just don't know what things are like out there. The Sweden that I myself grew up in had strong floors and whole ceilings. You were expected to make an effort and do your best, but you then also faced a strong society. That is what Sweden should be all about. And something has gone very wrong with Sweden and its welfare state. There's this lack of sense of security, waiting lists for care, housing shortage. These are things that now characterise our everyday lives. Social Democrats and Conservatives have fought for power all throughout these years. But regardless of the colour of the government in power, they have just continued to dismantle and deteriorate. We need a change for real. A new government on the left will take a completely different path, because this isn't working. The Swedish model needs to be restored. This feeling about worried about doing the right thing, this lack of pace, internal positioning that this government has spent its energies on, these are a threat to our common future. And we know, we do know how to build a strong country. We've done it before, when we went from being one of the most poorest countries in, the, in Europe to one of the most the best and most successful countries in the world. This is what a new government has as its task. And we, in, from the left party, we are ready to take responsibility for Sweden, a country that deserves better, that has the preconditions to become, once again, one of the best, most successful countries in the world. We demand a strong, this demands a strong uh, government that puts the Swedish people first. And those who have requested rejoinders, Annie Lerv from the Centre Party and Johan Persson. So first, Annie Lerv. The floor is yours, please. Fru <coughs> Talman, Vänsterpartiet. Madam his Speaker, the left party says uh, that they have an increased political commitment for rural areas. That is what we hear from each new spokesperson. But the problem is that we have the same old as left. They think that they know best how people are to live their lives and that the government, the state, has to do everything they wanted to uh, do away with rights for forestry owners, make it more difficult to live in rural areas. They want to do away with uh, the freedom to choose um, and uh, reduce accessibility to welfare, uh, close uh, schools in villages, etc. Could you explain how these uh, things could strengthen the freedom of choice if you're not allowed to manage your forests as you see best, and uh, why you can't build close to shorelines, and why should it be more expensive and more difficult to live uh, in the countryside? Madam Speaker, Annie Lerv uh, is completely wrong, as usual doesn't realize, doesn't the centre party realize the, how in, serious it is that we have six kroner higher tax, municipal tax in several regions that, compared to, for example, around Stockholm, and that is that the state has withdrawn, and Annie Lowe, when you stand in this cha chamber and destroy our uh, employment insurance and the employment public um, body, uh, this means that sick people need to be 
looked after by the municipalities and that the unemployed are helped by the municipalities, that it's the municipalities that pursue unemployment schemes. So this makes a hu means that we have a huge differences across the country. The responsibility of the state must once again be restored. We can't have, for example, health care, which differs so much between different regions. It's we, you can't then stand here in this chamber, in Stockholm, in the Riksdag, and just do away with the tax on the most rich living in Sauna, because then somebody else has to raise their taxes elsewhere. Good. Annelöv. Well, Madam uh, Speaker, Nushi Stadgoster hasn't quite understood when it comes to income tax for those who live in rural areas and what we've done there. I do see challenges with the high municipal taxes in municipalities where we have few inhabitants, and that is a problem, and this is where we need to discuss the system we have for equalization. But I do think that it's kind of odd uh, that you want to uh, reduce rights for forestry owners or to use uh, property close to shores. And uh, for example, in a state inquiry, you have a proposal that uh, the state should be allowed to seize land from property owners to increase the construction of housing. And how come you do not want to strengthen a private ownership? Because that would benefit small scale entrepreneurs in the countryside. Is it because it is what you say, what you've written, that you want to redistribute and change ownership structures? Madam Speaker, really, all of this ideological nonsense from Annie Love. Naturally, that's not the case. Naturally, there must be a balance between being able to safeguard biological diversity and forestry. And naturally, I also think that we need to look at protecting the most exploited shoreline at the same time as looking at relief elsewhere. But we need to talk to each other. But Annie Love is most known for not talking to anybody, actually. That is Manila's main problem here. And beyond that is also the fact that the Senti party stands here in the rickstar of our country and wants to better things, but only for those individuals who have tax cuts, who increase their property uh, rates, and this may, in, the cap, in the major cities, and those who have to pay for all this is, of course, the other municipalities, because then the other municipalities, they have to raise their municipal tax to ensure that they can create welfare locally because the state is not doing it. That is the main problem. Thank you, says the speaker. That's the end of that round of rejoinders. Next, we have Yuan Pashon from the Liberal Party, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, I do understand uh, that it's uh, difficult if you feel that you do not want to talk to each other in the Riksdag. Uh, that's very odd. But I can tell you that we like to talk to the left uh, party, but we have uh, very different starting points. I have to say that. And one thing is... And this is something I like, as a matter of fact, that we're straight in our communication. And I also want a health care insurance that actually works. And we want to focus, the Liberal Party wants to focus on getting people back to work. And their rehabilitation is very important. We also know that unemployment is a huge problem. It uh, creates uh, marginalization and many other problems. But... Nuti Dagestar, how are we to remedy these problems so that we can get more people into employment? Isn't it a good thing to reduce taxes on labor? Nuti Dagestar, please. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, that's nice to hear that you are passionate, that you want to speak to us. We can, we're happy to talk to you. Uh, now, changes in social insurance have, of course, meant that unemployment has grown enormously because these very unflex inflexible rules mean that many people, for example, care staff, who have been working throughout the pandemic, they go to the social insurance office and say, well, you have to um, leave your job 
full time instead of being able to work part time in their jobs as a nurse or as an auxiliary nurse or what have you. That is what the rules look like today, which means that they are maximizing unemployment. This is the problem. The social insurance rules mean that we aren't able to safeguard the ability of people to work in their professions. Instead, we ask them to ask for support in the municipalities who then have to pay this for this instead. Now, we would reduce the unemployment rate if we had a better social insurance scheme, which meant that well-qualified people could, in fact, go back to their jobs and their professions. Thank you, Your Honor, passion. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, that we have people paying into the system, that is okay. And then if they're ill, they get compensation. That is fine. But if this goes on for a very long time, then we have a problem because then someone else will have to pay. But I talked about this with taxes and people in employment. And uh, we heard here in the Riksdag from the finance minister that the possibility to reduce taxes means that more people can work and then you have more people who can go out and buy a cup of coffee. And this is an analysis from the Social Democrat Party that I agree with. And that is uh, gratifying. But we have to look at matching between individuals and jobs, for example. And here we have a work that has been started with reforming the unemployment agency. But the left, do you think that that's a bad thing? We've also looked at the, the possibility to have different types of support, for example, directly to companies in order to get more people into employment. And uh, if we can't do anything else, then we have to reduce taxes because that is how to improve the system. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I didn't quite follow your line of reasoning there, I'm afraid. Now, we create job opportunities by investing in the economy. Now, we do see that there's this green transition in Norbot and Vesterbottom, for example, and where we can create, if we want to create lots of job opportunities, we need to invest in a new electricity grid, new uh, production of electricity. We need to create new jobs. That's how we create them. We need to ensure that these companies have the preconditions to actually get their labor to these areas by building new rental accommodation. And of course, we need investments from the Rickstar. We need to ensure to that uh, look at the type of investment that we can make to do away with unemployment, and then we can get the economy going, but just sitting here, sitting back and pressing a 50 kroner note in the hands of one individual, that doesn't give new job opportunities at all. No, we need to invest in the economy in order to be able to create new job opportunities, and that applies to the public sector as well. Care, the system, the um, school system, they all need more investments. That's the end of that round of rejo rejoinders. Next, we have the speakers list, and the next speaker is Eba Bush from the Christian Democrats, please. Fru Talman. Madam Speaker, I would like to talk about the waiting lists in healthcare and patients who fail to get access to healthcare because half of those who have received information about treatment are now having to wait longer than the statutory 90 days, according to the law. A majority failed to be uh, taken care of in due time. It's partly linked to the pandemic, but not entirely, because before the pandemic struck, we saw uh, the uh, deterioration speeding up. It's detrimental to the Swedish economy, to patients and to healthcare workers. The way we organize healthcare dates back to 1862 here in Sweden. Now it's time for new elections soon and at the general election we will celebrate its 160 years, this healthcare organization. We have, as part of our election, uh, promised to build a new modern version like Norway and Denmark already did. The government parties, however, want to maintain what already exists, and they call me a conservative. Change is needed, and it is possible. Sweden doesn't have to stand, be at a standstill. We don't have to accept these long waiting times in healthcare. It is not a force of nature. Other countries have shown the way, but Sweden, who used to be well known for its welfare sector, is uh, has ground to a halt, not moving forward. When Norway modernizes healthcare, the starting in Parliament, uh, three major parties back this proposal in Sweden, a somewhat smaller party is alone in making health care its main priority. Madam Speaker, if Sweden is to have a health care sector which lives up to our, expect our reputation, it takes a new government with a heavy influence from the Christian Democrats. That is perfect 
perfectly clear. The healthcare waiting times is not a force of nature, but you need to want to deal with them, challenge old bureaucratic and institutional patterns. The Swedish people need to be able to trust and rely in Sweden and its healthcare sector, regardless of where you live. Thank you. Thank you. The Prime Minister Stefan Löfven from Social Democrats, Matt Stenevi of the Green Party, have requested rejoinders. Prime Minister has the floor first. No person was here again. <laughs> Your own passion has been here again. Oh dear. Madam Speaker, now initially I spoke about how quickly uh, political discussion and discourse has changed so quickly. And we talked about the adult in the room we heard a few years ago. And in countries like Germany, I think the Christian Democrats have really been the adults in the room. However, I don't think that that is the case any longer in our country. Now, that might may surprise some people, but I, I think we really do need a country that also highlights the perspective of the church and Christian values in our country, uh, safeguarding the situation of vulnerable people and migrants, and that really stand up for radical, uh, against radical nationalism from the white power environment. So therefore, Eba Bush, my question to you is, how can your Christian values, how do they govern you, the Christian Democrats, in your cooperation with the Sweden Democrats? Thank you. Eba Bush, please. Thank you. Our values, our background, this is uh, what provides us with the compass we need to navigate in an ever-changing political landscape. And the Christian democracy was created and came about as a counter uh, acting force to communism and Nazism. We have a different approach to humanity, to the equal value of each individual, and in particular giving support to the most vulnerable. I'm not trying in any way to cover up for the history of the Sweden Democrats, not in any way, nor am I trying to cover up for the communist background and history of the left party. I know where our red lines are drawn. And that is precisely why you can look not just at our, our words, but also our actions. More money for health care and for elderly care. When we speak both to the left party and the Sweden Democrats, Look at our actions. That's how you find out our message. Thank you. Prime Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. But there is still reason really to sit down and think about the fact that you stand for the Christian uh, values, but they still want to give influence uh, to somebody who wants to go against that, because that's the consequence of this cooperation. An article about after Rudd, one of the grandchildren of the founder of the Christian Democrats has left this uh, party, and in fact now the Social Dem Democrats are the main party among churchgoers. And just as Eber Bush has said, the tree can be recognised from the fruit that it carries, but why can't the Christian Democrats see, I mean, for example, what's happened in Germany, these uh, right-wing, these uh, xenophobic streams, they aren't new. Can't you see the scandals, the racism? You see the fruit, Eber Bush. But don't lean against that tree, please. Thank you. Eva Bush from the Christian Democrats. We have the church elections this coming uh, weekend. And I would like to see the merchants leave the temple. Political parties should have no place in the church uh, community. I'm very proud of my Christian background. Our Christian values guide us as a political party. However, we do not implement religious policies. We have supporting values to uh, back up our actions. Stefan Levin and the Social Democrats are using the painting in brown shades as the only means left to them to cover up the failure they represent in terms of standing up and protecting those most exposed and marginalised. We will read that all children who needed assistance services uh, from society um, were uh, denied it. We will read about refugees uh, back in their countries of origin who did not receive any help, uh, only the ones who made it all the way here. We will read of the waiting times in healthcare because you were on the wrong side of history. Thank you. That concludes this round of rejoinders. Marta Stenevi of the Green Party is next.
Fru Talman. Madam Speaker, now I also bear much with me from my Christian upbringing and the history books I'm sure will be talking about how the Christian Democrats closed the door to those who needed it most uh, when they want to cut uh, help to those who wanted it most and how they also uh, also disregard the fact that we need to look after our Mother Earth. Now, when the Christian Democrats are want to uh, come to power with the Conservatives and the Sweden Democrats, they're not going to wonder, uh, leads us to wonder about the climate policies that they're going to introduce. You want to build new nuclear power stations. We know that we've heard that many times for many years now. But my question to you is, this is the same question that I put to Ulf Kristersson, and that is, what is your time plan for that, please? How long does it take before you have a global carbon dioxide tax in place before you've negotiated in the EU? Before you, how long does it take before you've built this new nuclear power station? And during that time, what is your the Sweden Democrats, the moderates, and the Christian Democrats? What is your time plan, please? Thank you, Eva Bush from the Christian Democrats. I think it's important that in to me, it's important. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that Marta Stenevi is wrong in her introductory remark. And secondly, I'd like to point out that I'm not going to make promises that I cannot keep. I'm not prepared to give an, uh, a date of a year when it will be concluded because we need to refocus our policies. We need to make it a lot more realistic. Christian Democracy is based on the idea that we are responsible for what we've inherited and what we pass on to our children. I know that we partly unite in this. We are greatly committed to the environment, but we select the measures that are most effective, not perhaps the ones who would give the biggest number of likes on Instagram or somewhere else. And the reason why we're focusing on nuclear is not because we are opposed to solar or wind power or hydro power. It's because we see that if we're to be able to manage the transition in a realistic way, and because the climate and environmental issue is so important, then let's start by not closing down the, the uh, power plants for nuclear in uh, advance. Marta Stenevi. Thank you. Now, both Ebba Bush and, and I know that we have a surplus in electricity production, and that's not where the problem lies. So once again, when you as quickly as possible need to try to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement, the ones that we have said that we are going to do, and that I presume as a country, I mean, perhaps that's the question I should ask this power, this uh, government in, uh, in wait are you going to achieve the Paris Agreement? And I realise now, a bit late in the day, that that's perhaps the question I should be asking. But I, presuming that we are going to achieve those goals, or you want to achieve those goals, so if you're going to then uh, think that it's nuclear power that's the answer, a global carbon dioxide uh, tax that all countries are going to have signed uh, into, how are we going to cope with this plan, 2045, the one that we said 35, but 45, how are you going to be able to cope with the time plan are you taking this question seriously at all? Are you taking your the, the fact that you need to manage resources seriously at all? I would like to have an actual uh, thematic debate, but as a Christian Democrat, I cannot just let this one go. Whereas the biggest uh, idea tradition uh, organization in Europe is affiliated party linked to Angela Merkel's party. Don't call me uh, brown uh, or, or blue-brown. I am blue. I know precisely which rooms for negotiation I'm ready to step into and leave. Don't take the painting in different shades uh, easily. Don't shake it off. A Nazi link or a racist link be hinted at. I didn't drive policies which meant that people who really didn't have any uh, right of asylum have been granted the right to stay, whereas others have been sent away or not even had the opportunity to apply for asylum in Sweden. I know exactly where we have our values. Take the debate on climate and the environment a bit more seriously than to just accuse, uh, make accusations across the board. Thank you. That concludes this round of rejoinders. And the next speaker is uh, Johan Persson for his address from the Liberal Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Now, we've had this been a long 
we're approaching the end of this long debate this morning, um, bearing in mind the latest round of rejoinders, perhaps I've also, I mean, I've also attended Sunday school, so I know where I stand as well. Now, I'd also like to say a little bit about the waiting lists that Ebba Bush mentioned, because we are talking about wasting lists in many places in Sweden, not just ca for care uh, due to the pandemic. This is something that we now together need to, to deal with. We've also talked about uh, the unemployment rate. This is uh, difficult for people, crushing their hopes for the future. But there are other waiting lists as well. There are waiting lists, for example, at police stations, uh, at our courts within um, get, uh, pro our prison and probation service. They're waiting at the queue or lines or lists the prosecution services as well, and and this is very important, bearing in mind we need to be able to uh, deal with criminal cases as quickly as, as possible. Now, the rule of law is, is something very fundamental. It's something that it's not a budgetary item that's comparable with, for example, rural affairs. I mean, our courts are so much more important than that. Um, now, uh, now I, the, I did attend Sunday school, so I know that the rural matters are equally important, but still, courts are so important. And the situation that we find ourselves in, that there are people who are worried, they're upset about their lives in areas where there's so much violence, people are being killed on open streets any, you know, now and then, and it happens, it does happen. And then they're also perhaps worried about a police state, and you shouldn't undermine or you shouldn't um, forget that they have that fear. So for 2022, we need the rule of law back again in our country throughout our liberal state. Thank you. Matt Dusty and the man from the Green Party, please. Next. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Now we've heard addresses from all the party leaders in the chamber. And from the blue-brown group, I am going to refer to it as blue and brown, regardless of what individual parties uh, choose to use as a designation. We've heard the same tired statements. Someone else in the world will tackle the climate crisis. Emissions should go down somewhere else. Some other time, maybe later, we may have built something which possibly could catch the emissions we don't have the energy to reduce now. It makes you despair a little bit. Where is the willingness to fight, the willingness to, to change? You chose politics, after all, back to, from the days when you were at school. The climate crisis is happening now. At the same time, with this sad, tired message being repeated again in the chamber, I see something else outside the windows. Something new is coming. Young people globally refuse to accept the failure by adults to deal with, by the grown-ups to deal with the environment. Mothers in the suburbs refuse to have children, their children die and be left in the streets. And women won't stay silent in the face of violence against themselves and their children where they, where they should be at the most secure in home. Although there wasn't a lot said in the chamber today about this. Another world is not just possible. It's coming. It's on its way. I can hear her breathing on a silent day. Arundhati Roy, the Indian author, wrote this. And to all you young who fight to stop climate change, mothers demanding justice for their children and women who refuse to stay silent about men's violence, I say this. I can hear the breathing of a different world in your fight with politics, with justice and with climate action. We will create it. Thank you very much. Johan Persson from the Liberals has requested a rejoinder to Marta Stenevi's address. You have the floor. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I think it's really boring when you don't get a rejoinder, so I'm going to ensure that you get one at least. Now, as regards the climate, now, electricity means 
cost two kroner per watt, and then Karlshamn's power plant, for example, is on, as it were, and that's on the 15th of September. I mean, the sun is shining in 2021, and we're still burning fossil fuels to have, ensure that we have electricity throughout the country. This is a disaster, getting electricity to the right place at the right time. Luckily, we have this European cooperation. But my question was something else, actually, and that is the Green Party, that you suddenly want to combat crime. This is a new awakening. That's very pleasing. And we had that is what well, not what well, we had that well, not one kroner should go to g crazy fundamentalists. I appreciate that. It's time to put a stop to all of that. However, the Green Party, do you want to combat combat the cl clans as well to try to get rid of this sort of thing so that dates back to the Middle Ages? Are you prepared to do that, Matta Stinvi from the Greens? First, I think we need to clarify some concepts a little bit. We have an export of electricity which amounted to the uh, equivalent of all the three Baltic states' uh, consumption in terms of volume, so that we would have a shortage of electricity is not correct. As for transmission capacity, however, there is a number of measures underway to ensure that we have more rapid expansions of the grid. Now, Johan Persson is, of course, well familiar with this as well. We do not, however, have a uh, production-related shortage. But perhaps Johan Persson would also be able, um, Madam Speaker, to answer the question of if the Sweden Democrats let the Liberals into a blue-brown upcoming government, can uh, you tell us whether you will abide by the Paris Agreement? I never received an answer to that question. We are prepared to combat all organized uh, structures for uh, in the criminal sense, whether we call them MC clubs or clans or gangs, any type of organized crime will be combated. Thank you. You are person, the Liberals. Thank you, Madam Speaker. That's very pleasing to my ears. We do have a power plant, power plant now spurting out carbon dioxide. dioxide. And for me, I get very angry at this. When I see this, but in Sweden, we are burning these fossil fuels and the smoke just goes up into the sky. Now, but it's incredible, and you, for the last seven years, you've had time to have this green trust, but there's too little capacity, you phase out nuclear power, and you don't ensure, too, that we have this transition to renewables. Now, the clans, it pleases me to hear that the Greens are, in fact, being able to say these words, that we have stru uh, structures, that we have deprived areas, and that things that belong to the Middle Ages, and that we really need to deal with a sort of... They commit crimes, they threaten, they put pressure on people, blackmail people, and they kill people. But this is the first time that I've actually heard a Green Party say that there are these clans and gangs in Sweden that they need to be combated. Thank you. Meta Sinri. That's it. I belong to a clan, a very strong matriarchically governed clan. It's wonderful. It has nothing to do with organized crime. The structures which uh, focus on organized crime, regardless of what type of community you belong to, has to be combated. There are motorcycle groups, there are those uh, built on friendship, there are different structures. If they're into organized crime, we will combat them. But, Johan, we have to uh, get back to this uh, other issue. We've expanded renewables very rapidly. If you would like... if. Uh, the Honourable Member would like to work together with the Green Party to close a fossil power plant. Be my guest, I would be more than happy to oblige, but do not use the power plant as an argument to say that we ha would have uh, too low production. We can expand renewable energy way uh, more, but we export clean electricity corresponding to the entire consumption in the three Baltic states every year. Thank you. That concludes this round of rejoinders. That also concludes the party leaders' debate. Thank you to the Prime Minister and to all the party leaders and party representatives who attended. Thank you. Punkt 5. Anmälan om fakta promemoria. Jag anmäler att en fakta promemoria har inkommit och överlämnas till utskott enligt föredragningslista. 
Punkt 6 till 21. Ärenden för hänvisning till utskott. Propositioner, skrivelser och EU-dokument hänvisas till utskott enligt förslag på föredragningslistan. Och därmed är samtliga ärenden på dagens föredragningslista behandlade. Kammaren övergår till anmälan av dokument med mera som har inkommit under dagen. Till bordläggning anmäls två EU-dokument. Och jag får anmäla att en interpellation och åtta frågor framställs. Beslutar kammaren att avsluta sitt sammanträde? Svaret är ja.